Mayor Bagley. Here. Council Member Christensen. Here. Council Member Adalgo Faring. Here. Council Member Martin. Here. Council Member Peck. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Here. And Council Member Waters. Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. All right, now let's go ahead and start with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Harold, would you like to lead us, please? Well, we all do it. I'm counting on you. You got to do it. All you got to do is say, I pledge allegiance. And then that's it. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, the to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America. and, and to, to the republic, republic for which it stands, which it stands. One, one nation, nation under God, under God indivisible, 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 with liberty, with liberty and justice, justice, for, all. justice, justice, justice for, all. for all. All right. Thank you, Harold. You did a fantastic job. All right. Let's go ahead and remind everybody, anybody wishing to provide public comment during the public invited to be heard, uh, let's please make sure you're watching live stream of the meeting for instructions. When the call-in information occurs, you will then get this screen. Um, at which point um, you will be called into the room. You'll be identified by the last two digits of your phone number and uh, asked to enter, state your address, name, and then state whatever you want to state as long as it's under three minutes. At three minutes, we'll have to cut you off just because that is the rule. So can I have the screen back, please? Great. Do we have any motions to direct the city manager to add agenda items to the future? Council Member Christensen. Yes. Um... I, I know that all of you received the same emails that I receive, so I know you're all aware of this. Uh, Broomfield County or Broomfield City Council last week, I believe, passed uh, ordinance, emergency ordinance 2135, temporary prohibition on rental late fees. Um, I know that um, I sent this to... Uh, um, the city manager and to the city attorney over the weekend, and they had or they were already looking at this. So I would like to formally put it on the agenda uh, for a future meeting. Um, the reason I want to do this is because uh, we are in an emergency, and um, there are good landlords and there are bad landlords. There are good tenants and there are bad tenants. Um, late fees are for bad tenants who were perpetually wait to let them know that they can't be late because landlord has to pay their mortgage. They don't, they may discourage um, bad tenants, but they don't do anything for good tenants. Good tenants are not late with their rent unless they lost their job, they lost their health insurance, they, um, they sick, any kind of emergency like that. We do not want to add to the list of evictions for something like a late rent fee. Um, so that's why I would like a second for this emergency measure, which is temporary, a temporary prohibition on rental late fees. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Thanks. All right, uh, it's open for debate. Whether or not we're gonna put this on the agenda, do we have any comments? All right, I'm gonna be voting against it only because uh, I think governments over the last six months have just gone overboard on interference in business, the economy, our lives. And uh, if you have a contract, which is what rent is, it's basically a lease between two parties. The government has no business getting involved. And uh, uh, whether you're a landlord or, I mean, the. Anyway, I'm just going to vote against it, and I'll fight like mad against it. Dr. Waters? Uh, thanks, Mayor Bagley. Um, I also forwarded the, that um, ordinance to the city attorney uh, to get his feedback. And um, and I'm not, I mean, I think there's a bunch of questions we need to answer, uh, uh, both policy and legal. Uh, but I'm going to vote to put it on the agenda, because I do think we ought to have a serious, deep conversation. Uh, everything from the role of government relative to these kinds of concerns uh, to what the what the parameters are for what Roomfield did or what we might do. Um, so I'm going to vote for it. I think it's a conversation we ought to have, and I think we ought to get kind of input from the city attorney when the time comes um, that will help us make the most informed possible decision. All right. All in favor, say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Nay. All right, motion carries six to one. Okay, anybody else? Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I would like uh, council to bear with me for a moment while I explain my motion. Uh, I'm going to circle back on our air quality monitoring contract. Uh, council voted to renew Boulder Air's contract with an amendment to the addendum to the contract. Thank you very much. Uh, the addendum states that before Boulder Air can give a presentation, it must submit that presentation to city, city staff for monitoring the data and the message which is being presented. And this could be a seven day turnaround. The amendment to that addendum is that states that along with submitting the presentation material to staff, the presentation will also go to city council for monitoring, uh, for monitoring that presentation to see if it adheres to the contract. Here's my concern. That whole process could take up to two weeks depending upon when that item hits our agenda. My opinion is that this is a bit of overreach on Boulder Air's ability to run their business and uh, do their presentation, presentations in a timely manner. I don't think, uh, and Eugene would have, have to answer this, but I don't think this has anything to do with the contract. It is just council's uh, turnaround. So therefore, uh, I move that city staff, upon reviewing Boulder Air's presentation schedule, send it to city council for their purview within 48 hours of staff's review. This is to keep it from stretching out two weeks when it could hit an agenda, hamstringing Boulder Air's ability. I'm not sure that, again, Mayor Bagley, government has the right to do, to try to interfere with when these presentations can or can't be given. Um, so that's my, uh, that's my motion. Upon reviewing Boulder Air's presentation schedule, send it to city council for their pre purview within 48 hours of staff's review, just to move it along. Council, Council Mayor Martin. Um, I hope that Councilwoman oh. Peck has mischaracterized this because. Wait, Council uh, Mayor Martin, hold on. There's, there's, there's yet to have a second for the motion. So any comments without a second are out of order. So someone wants to make a second. All right. Okay, Council Members, Key Doggo Faring seconded it. Okay, Councilmember Martin, go ahead. And then you're yeah, next, Councilmember Christensen. I think that this is mischaracterized because the motion was um, that it needed to come before Council only if it was the decision of the staff that the presentation wouldn't be allowed at all. Correct. And so, Correct. Um, but that's different than what was stated, and that's, that makes a big difference uh, in terms, you know, it means coming to council once a year or never, as opposed to coming to council every time, which was what I understood from uh, the council member Peck's restatement. So, um, Mayor Bagley, should I restate that uh, in a more... Sure, sure, why don't you go ahead and address that, and then council member Christensen, you'll be after council member Peck. Thank you. So therefore, uh, let me just restate it because uh, if Council Member Martin didn't understand and I didn't state it correctly, that's, that's an important point. So I moved that city staff upon reviewing Boulder Air's presentation schedule and denying it, they send it to city council for their purview within 48 hours of staff's denial of the presentation. Is that, is that more clear? Uh, Council Member Martin? I think it is. You okay. still second that, Susie? Okay. Council Member Christensen? Uh, originally, I was just going to second it, but <laughs> so I, I frankly do not think we should have this in here at all. I don't think there is any reason for us to second guess what a business is, uh, you know, a, a scientific presentation. I don't think it's either city city halls or city staff's um, uh, purview or a city council's purview to stifle intellectual and scientific uh, speech. But 
given that we've decided to do that, I uh, I applaud Councilman Peck for um, bringing this forward because at least it um, allows Dr. Hetlick help Helmig should he be found um, to be uh, told he can't do a presentation. Um, at least it gives him a little bit more um, timely response from us. Thank you. All right, see nobody else, let's vote. All in, oh, sorry, Dr. Waters, go ahead. Um, so just let me, we're, we're, this is a motion not to bring the contract back to the council. Correct. This is a motion to amend the, um, to amend the amended amendment. It's basically saying, it's a motion to say, hey, if, city, if the city staff denies Dr. Helmig the opportunity to share or present his data, upon that denial, they will have 48 hours to tell us about it so we can override it should we feel that we should or need to. So, uh, so it would help me to, let me just make a statement. One of the, I voted against the amend, amendment to the amendment I, for several reasons. One of which was the length of time it would take to, if the staff said no, now it's gonna to come to the council for the very reason the council member Peck has identified in terms of drawing this out. But that said, um, could, uh, council member Peck, if you could just dis to describe what your assumption is if uh, the staff says, we're gonna deny your opportunity to make this presentation, we get it within 48 hours, then what? Are well, we then I, Council Member uh, Waters, that's a great question. And um, I think that's a Eugene question. If uh, my concern is that if we put it on an agenda, it could go another two weeks before it gets on an agenda, which means with the seven days that staff has it, plus 14 days that it comes back to council, uh, Boulder Air will lose business, and do we have the right to do that to a company, regardless? So um, with how we uh, vote on that denial would be a U Eugene question. Can we do it uh, by consensus through a confidential email? Can we, um, and, and that is, that would be part of uh, how we do that. I don't know that answer. Well, I mean, I, well, I don't know it. I mean, the answer, I mean, the, the way, it, I mean, just the way it always works is either I'd put it on the agenda or on Tuesday, you guys would vote to put it on the agenda. Um, and the, the other, I guess what also comes to mind is I can't imagine a scenario where their business model is relying upon the data that Longwood is paying to collect. Um, and uh, I see you, Marsha, I see you. It's okay, I'll get to you in just a second. Hold on. Um, and the, uh, and I think that, uh, uh, and in, in, if he's going to give it, I mean, I imagine that he'd be using the data to give a presentation. And I can't imagine a scenario where all of a sudden it's like the next day or two days or three days from now, he'd have to have permission in order to, you know, present to a local political group. So, okay. I mean, I, I, guess, I, I guess what I'm saying is I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. I don't see a reason why this would be any different than any other topic that we that we deal with as a council. But Councilmember Martin. Well, I think there are a couple of of misconceptions floating around. The first, and the reason I was waving at you, Mayor Bagley, um, is that it's not about the data. Um, it's our data, not his data. Um, but it is his scientific analysis, which in it is an entirely different thing. The city of Longmont should not have get in the business of suppressing scientific analysis, even if we did pay for the analysis to be done. Um, and so that's why I didn't want the mayor to keep saying data. Um, the second thing is that I don't, it's, it's my opinion, and we probably would need a city attorney to weigh in on this, it's my opinion that, that the city didn't actually intend this, to have the staff ever suppress the scientific analysis. They just wanted to review the words to make sure that they didn't inadvertently make a statement about city policy. And if the staff doesn't, isn't, isn't likely to do that, you know, so they're not likely to suppress anything, but the way the paragraph was written it said that they could suppress it. I am happy with any language 
that says they can't suppress it. They can only change the wording to take the city's, uh, to, to make sure that it does not misrepresent the city of Longmont. So, um, you know, speeding it up, fine, taking it out entirely, but taking out the words that says that, you know, give it, making, uh, making it so that the staff has to make their edits in a reasonable amount of time, that's fine too. We just need to get that language out of there that says that they can stop it. Now, we probably should ask the city attorney whether it was intentional that um, the staff have the power to stop a scientific paper or presentation. So I'm asking. Eugene? Mayor and Council, uh, my understanding that, and you know, I was not administering the contract, but my understanding that this provision was intended to uh, address a situation where Dr. Helmig was presenting city data before the city got it. And so we need to know what our data is before he is presenting it. it we paid for it. It's in his contract. He has deliverables. Um, it wasn't meant to suppress, but if he hasn't provided the data to the client first, we thought that he should not be presenting it to the public. So that's different than the way it was presented to us last week. Correct. Um, and again, we have this little bit of confusion between thoughts and data. Um, you know, if, if, I mean, I could kind of agree that we should know what the conclusions from the data are before they are presented outside. Um, but again, that gets into allowing the staff to hold something up for a long time. Mm -hmm. So it, it sounds really to me like this has not been thought through well enough. Uh, Dale? Mayor Bagley and members of council, you know, listening to this discussion, it sounds similar to the one that we had uh, last week. And I think I said at that time, uh, it was never staff's intent to deny the ability of Dr. Helmick to make a presentation. Um, I am fine removing that um, condition, if you will, from the contract. As Eugene said, our interest is not being surprised by something that's out in the public realm and our responsibility to the council to be able to uh, notify you that, uh, you know, presentations being made, it's this data and so on and so forth. It's never the intent to deny, uh, certainly, uh, you know, the ability uh, to present uh, valid data and the analysis of that data. And so a couple of things though, since last week, We've modified the contract to, to you know, modify that deny issue. The Dr. Helmig has signed the contract. It's ready for the mayor's signature. I don't believe that's happened yet. So the timing is fine. If you want us to remodify, I think if you want to give us that direction tonight, I, I believe, um, and like Eugene, I wasn't in the middle of all the, the back and forth on the contract terms, but I'm more than happy to engage on that. I think I got a pretty good sense of the council's interest, um, but but that is why we had a clause in there, so that we were not in a posi an awkward position of not knowing um, uh, it, what the data was, let alone what the analysis was um, prior to it being uh, made public. But I think we can we can finesse that wording. We got the understanding, and none of us are going to be in the position of denying somebody. Uh, making a presentation. So what does that leave us with motion? Where does that leave us? It leaves us with the motion on the floor. Um, that's it. And then Council, uh, Dr. Waters. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Um, I'm going to vote against the motion. Not be and I think I might agree with it ultimately, but I, this is not the way, in my view, this is not the way we go about Editing contract language. It's not in front of us. It was there last week. Um, I appreciate the, the concern and the sentiment. I'm not, I'm not being critical of anything other than process. Um, 
Uh, if, if the contract hasn't been signed, then bring it back so we can at least eliminate the confusion. Clearly, there's confusion. There was last week, and it just feels to me like we're not going to – I'm not certain I can answer a question tomorrow, and I've been listening, about exactly what the parameters would be for Dr. Almey with what we're talking about. So uh, I, I may – if I had a chance to see that language in the amendment that's being proposed, I might vote for it. But I – but the process is just not one that – that I think makes sense for a body like this as an approach to editing contract language. So I'm gonna vote no for that reason. I would prefer maybe to see somebody make a motion to bring it back, move, move it to bring it back on, on, on an agenda so we could be, all be clear on exactly what we're voting on and what the language requires. Councilor Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley, and thank everybody for your discussion. Um, I am gonna withdraw that motion then and make a new one. Um, that I uh, would like us to direct staff to bring back the Boulder Air contract uh, with two things, removing that first paragraph um, uh, about the presentation being reviewed by staff. And the reason I feel this way is that in the shared agreement part of the, uh, con of the addendum, it actually addresses the research and the shared part of that agreement. Um, sharing it with researchers or other educational uh, departments or universities. I feel that that is where that is addressed in this addendum. The very first paragraph, uh, I would like, okay, I move to direct staff to bring back this contract, removing that first paragraph about city staff uh, reviewing all the presentations that uh, Doc Boulder Air is uh, lining up to present. Um, or, and I, I, want to, I want to bring back two, two versions, one of them amending that first paragraph and one of them taking it out so that we can see as a council what the difference is and where this leaves us in having a solid contract and understanding it so that we can uh, all agree that this is a good solid contract, both for the city and for both Boulder Air. So can you summarize that for me, Mayor Backley? <laughs> yeah, let me do that in just a second. Councilmember Pat, uh, Councilmember Christensen. Sorry, I would second that. But I would also like to say that I, I, I'm, I would second that because I, I do feel that it is already in the contract that Dr. Helmick may, may not make uh, policy discussions for the city and speak on behalf of the city. That's obvious, but it's in the contract. And I think that resolves everything. He may make, um, do a ana scientific analysis and um, that's what he does for a living. And I'm sh pretty sure that's all he's really interested <laughs> in doing um, after going through all this. Um, so I would second that. I think it is better to have, a con have contracts that are as clear and, as simple as possible, given how there are very few really simple contracts, but there is no need to make something that is more unwieldy and uh, causes more time for staff and more stress with uh, the the uh, other signer of the contract. There has to be some sort of um, equality of agreement. So um, I would second that. I guess the, uh, I guess the, so there's a motion on the floor and I'm going to restate the motion, which was basically Councilmember Peck said um, the motion was to bring back the contract with two versions, one removing the first paragraph and another one restating the paragraph in order to limit the staff's ability to deny Dr. Helmig uh, uh, the ability to share his data and conclusions. Um, did I sum summarize that good enough? Yeah. Yes, Mayor, thank you. Okay, I guess the, the only thing that I'm thinking is I've been in I've been in law long enough to know that whenever you hire an expert and rely on him and then put all your eggs in that basket, it can bite you. What happens if he's got flawed data and it comes back that his conclusions don't support what you think they're going to say? I personally would want to know that before he goes public with it. I'd want the opportunity to um, maybe reanalyze that data, talk to Dale about it talk to Eugene about it, tell him don't release that report. 
Um, I'm just, I'm just saying that, uh, that, uh, uh, I can think of all kinds of reasons why it would be wise to have access to the information before it goes public. Councilmember Christensen. Don't we already have access to that? Isn't it published in real time? I thought it was up on a website and published in real time. So everyone has access to it already if they yeah. want to look it over. Isn't that correct? I don't know. But I, I th thought that was, you know, the whole point of this is that people could see this in real time or s certainly see it a, on a daily basis. If that's, if that's the case, then this conversation's moot. Dale? I don't believe um, Council Member Christensen and, and Mayor Bagley, uh, the information that is being placed out on the city's website, think of that as sort of a, uh, a dashboard, a summary. It is not the raw data. Uh, the raw data is behind that. Thank you, Dale. All right, Councilmember Martin, and then let's let's try to let's try to minimize comments. We have a lot to get through tonight, and I know, a, this I is know, a, this is just a fraction of what we as a city council need be, need to be dealing with right now. Yeah. Councilor so here's Martin. here's the deal. The what's on the website is is as uh, city deputy city manager Rademacher said. It's it's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, it's an early warning system, but um, the knowing what Mayor Bagley said that one should know before releasing it would be very nice, but it's not knowable. I mean, what he described is the entire scientific peer review process. So if Dr. Helmig is going to publish something um, or present some interim findings, they're not peer reviewed yet. It's a common occurrence that that something like that has to be retracted, but the city of Longmont scientists, as good as they are, are not going to be able to, to make a, a ruling on something like that. You know, that's why we hire uh, someone who is purportedly a leader in the field. And the only people who can call him out on an error are the other leaders in the field. So um, that, and that's exactly why uh, we we don't want to be able to suppress it at all, and and it's um, it's really uh, uh, what I don't like about Council Member Peck's second motion is that it appears to me that that we did not sufficiently consider the requirements for review and what our objective was. And we have, we've had people stated at least two different ways and I think three. So um, my suggestion would, would be to let it stand as it is while the city attorneys consider um, a more streamlined version of that clause that, that does, that gets the requirements right and um, doesn't allow for the suppression of scientific conclusions, but does give the city the ability to edit wording or, or uh, you know, say, hey, wait a minute, this is city policy. You need to stay away from that part, which I think was the only intent. One more. Back. Thank you. Um, uh, Councilman Martin, that's exactly why I asked for the well, two. Sorry, Aaron, you're next. I'd see you now either to take it out or to bring it back amended, which would be some of the language that you just stated. And, um, and, and I agree with you. Yeah, I know where you were going. I, I think that the, the amendment basically states that, to bring back an amended version of that or a, a better explanation of, of that first paragraph. And then as a council, we get to decide. which Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I guess I'm not sure that we are going through all of this effort for a specifically good reason. In the concept that I think Dr. Helmig agreed to the original contract language, as well as apparently agreed to the new amended language, and I think that's because this wouldn't be a problem. A man of his discipline would likely know how to give presentations in a way that are not going to infringe upon 
the contract rights of say the city of Longmont in this particular instance or in any other instance. And so I don't think it was ever problematic for Dr. Helmig necessarily to agree to these contracts amended or unamended as in it just simply would not in, infringe upon his uh, ability to operate his business as he sees fit. Um, so I think that we're, we're just going through a lot of trouble for, for not really the right reasons. I do understand the um, concept that it would appear that we'd be infringing upon his rights to speak freely about his work. But I just don't, I don't see that he would agree to both of these contracts so freely if that were truly the case. So I'm just not sure we're, we're barking up the right tree. So I don't, I don't think I can, I think we should, whatever we can do to just get going forward on this contract is probably more benefit to Longmont as far as the monitoring process is concerned than arguing over some contract language that Dr. Helmig had no problems with one way or another. Thank you. I, I think that's wise counsel. Thank you. Um, Eugene? Mayor, sorry to interject. I, I'm not clear. So I understand the first version, which is remove the bullet point. I'm not clear exactly what the second amended version is. Is it with the 48 hours to counsel the first motion? Or is it a different concept that I should be drafting? I don't know, Eugene. Dale? I withdrew. Let, let, me, let me try one, uh, Mayor Bagley and members of council. Um, two things um, I want to make you aware of. One is, is that his contract ended on August 31st, which is why we had it in front of you at the meeting we did, which is why we've had him execute it, and it's ready for the mayor's signature. So timing is sort of important, I think, right now. I understand the council's desire to remove. I, I'm looking to remove the, the staff's ability to deny and, and bring back a version that essentially takes that out. If we can do that, if we could execute the contract as it is now, bring that amendment back for you at a regular meeting in September, we won't have a lapse in his contract, which I think is an important thing given that this is continuous air quality monitoring. Um, I think we can manage that. It'd be difficult for us to get it to the next regular meeting because that packet's ready to roll. Uh, and, and if we're not careful, we're going to be towards the middle or end of September at a regular meeting for you guys to act on it. So if, if, if that could be considered, I think that's a path forward to get us through tonight. So Joan, do you mind? So what I would suggest is I sign it. Um, I instruct Harold right now to put it on a future agenda, um, a contract amendment, re removing staff's ability to die, deny Dr. Helmig the ability to use his data. And then we can just, he can get going on the contract. He can get continue with his monitoring. It gets put on the agenda. We accomplish what I think you're trying to accomplish. And we just, we just get it done. Is that okay? That sounds great. Thank you, Dale and Mayor Bagley. Okay, so, so Harold, if, if you could just put that on the future agenda, make note, it's public record that the mayor's asking for that. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Anything else on this issue, guys? All right, perfect. Anything else? All right, then let's move on to public. Let's move on to public invited to be heard. Let's go ahead and take a brief break while we open it up and let people call in. All right, be back in four minutes, guys. Please, thank you.
All right. I see four of us, five of us. I'm just waiting on Polly and Joan. There's Joan. Polly, are you within earshot? Mayor, while we're waiting, I'm going to go ahead and admit these callers. We have seven callers tonight. Callers, while you are joining the meeting, welcome to the City Council meeting for uh, September 1st. Just like to remind you to please mute the live stream in the background as you come into the meeting so you can hear us speaking to you uh, and you can speak your comments without any trouble. Let me know, Mayor, when you're ready for the first one. All right, we're ready. Let's go ahead. Caller will, callers will identify you with the, uh, we got one more coming in, uh, by the last three numbers of your phone number. I'm going to start with caller number 297. And how many do we have? We now have eight. Okay, perfect. Caller phone number ending in 297, going to unmute you. Please state your name and address for the record. Caller 297, can you unmute yourself? Hi, this is Truman Bradley from the Marijuana Industry Group. Are you able to hear me? Yes. We can hear you perfectly. Mm -hmm. Hi, I live at 2930 Vance Street in Wheat Ridge, Colorado. And I was just calling to say thank you for considering delivery. Um, it looks like medical only is currently what's being discussed, but um, we just encourage Longmont to consider delivery first and foremost for medical um, as well as ultimately recreational. I think it's um, what keeps people the safest. I know that several licensees have testified saying that they don't think it's a great idea, um, but that's not a reason to make a rule against it. Um, you know, in this day and age, a lot of people prefer to get delivery. I think it's the way of the future. Cannabis is the only um, industry in Colorado that was deemed essential that doesn't have delivery right now. And my feeling is, you know, if an individual business does or doesn't want to do it, as long as it can be done safely, which I think it certainly can be, um, then why not go for it? I mean, it's 2020. Um, so uh, thank you respectfully and i um, happy to take any questions, but that's it. Thank you, sir. All right, next caller. My apologies, caller with phone number ending in 499. I'm going to unmute you. Four nine nine. Can you unmute yourself? And state your name and address for the record. Sorry, one more time. Caller four nine nine. Can you unmute yourself? State your name and address for the record. Let's try the next one. Okay, we'll come back to 499. Caller 584, going to unmute you. Please un please go ahead and state your name and address for the record, if you can unmute yourself. Caller 584. All right, let's go to the awesome next network. one. All right, moving on. Caller 777, your phone number ends in 777. Can you unmute yourself and state your name and address for the record? Hello, hello. We can, can hear you, you hear just me? fine. Yes, we can. Finally, okay, I am 499. This <laughs> is Doe Kelly. I live on Barberry Drive in Longmont, okay. Good evening to you all. I have what I think is a big question for you. Should you decide without further and extensive study that an acceleration of the proposed AMI, uh, AKA smart meter program is warranted, 
Will you be offering the residents of Longmont to complete informed consent? Will you inform them that there could be adverse health consequences for them or their loved ones simply with the added electromagnetic load of a smart meter pulsating microwaves on and through their dwelling? Or will you let them know the addition of a wireless smart meter is a threat to both their privacy as well as their security? Will you tell them that the pollinators already in steep decline will now receive an even greater dose of microwave radiation than that which is already ambient in the environment as invisible electrosmog? Will you show them the studies that prove wildlife is also adversely affected by increasing electromagnetic radiation according to peer-reviewed science? Alternatively, will you inform us, the citizenry, that wired metering is private, secure, provides more accurate billing, resists hacking, and last but not least, does not emit harmful microwave radiation on a 24-7 basis that kills birds, bees, and butterflies? I spoke to you in February of this year on the dangers inherent in microwave radiation and our current cultural paradigm. I told you of my own experiences of becoming electrosensitive when the next light wireless internet was installed in our home four years ago. I have also spoken twice to the Sustainability Advisory Board where I implored them to deeply study the proposed smart meter rollout before giving their recommendation to the council. I implored them to call in Tim Sheckley, PhD, an internationally recognized and sought after expert on wired and wireless communications. Tim is the expert's expert, having been in on the development of this entire field of technology from the very beginning. I continue to strongly advocate for a study session or presentation that features Tim, and I believe this is warranted before any decisions are made on AMI. Tim lives in Boulder. He and his expertise are available to us all. Why are we not taking advantage of that which is before our eyes and under our noses? So now another question we all deserve an answer to, will the city of Longmont be fully insured against health related or other liability claims such as fires started by smart meters should we roll out AMI here? We, the residents of Longmont, deserve to know if our taxes will pay for liability claims from the use of a soon-to-be obsolete technology, according to Tim, that to my knowledge, insurance carriers will not insure. Wireless smart meters have a wide range of problems, such as sustainability, security, privacy, human health issues, longevity, and obsolescence, compared with analog technology, including fiber. Longmont can again take international leadership in the field of sustainability and innovation through deeply considered, wise, wired choices. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Next caller. Mayor, um, next caller is, um, last three digits are 584. Caller 584, you should be able to unmute yourself. Caller 584. Caller 584, I'm unmuting you unsuccessfully. <laughs> Don, make sure that you've checked that allow on the bottom. Yes, I have. Yes, it's unchecked. They can unmute themselves. Okay. All right, everybody listening to the live feed, um, we're gonna go ahead and try twice. And if you don't unmute yourself within the first 15 seconds, we're gonna go on to the next person and then we're gonna put you at the end of the line because uh, we're wasting a lot of time. So Don, let's just go ahead and, and do that. All right, Mayor. And if everybody would please remember to mute the live stream. I think there's a 30 second delay. People hear the instruction. 30 seconds later, which causes some challenge. So we'll skip 584, we'll go to 777. Caller with phone number ending in 777. You should be able to unmute yourself. Caller 777. So Don, are you saying that there's a 30 second delay between you saying that? And then them unmuting themselves? If they're listening to the live stream for instruction instead of into their phone, yes. Does that make sense? A caller's, then, they're listening then, to their TV or the we'll, computer. 
Right, then we'll need to wait at least 30 seconds plus 15. So um, we'll need to, no, that's problematic. It, yes. I'm gonna continue, caller 777. Your phone number ends in 777. Please unmute yourself and state your name and address for the record. And we might want to include that. They need to be listening to their phone rather than the live stream from now on in the instructions. Yes, Mayor, we do have it there. We say, please mute the live stream, but we can for yeah, that. I've, and I've heard that, but I've always assumed it was because of background noise. Hello? Very good. Caller Hello. 777, we can hear you. Please state your name and address for the record. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley and council members. Uh, my name is Abe Melendez. I am at 1543 South Kaufman. I'm calling on the concerns of the light that is being put up at Kaufman and Pike. I've been at 1543 South Kaufman and Southmore Park since 1981. Uh, throughout the years, the neighborhood has slowly evolved to where there are more families with the young, younger kids. And our concern is the neighborhood, in the neighborhood is the growing number of vehicles that are being funneled down our street from the town of Prospect and Pike. The amount of traffic is a big concern and the speed of the vehicles is also a very big concern. We in the neighborhood do not believe that the light is appropriate for a residential neighborhood. The residents in this neighborhood were not made aware that a light was being installed and that our street was going, was going to become a collector street. We are now seeing the impact of that decision in the increase and the amount and speed of vehicles going through. That has made South Kaufman a lot busier and a lot more dangerous. And, it, and we believe that it will only get worse in the future. We are very worried of the decision that was trust upon us in this neighborhood. Thank you. All right, thank you, sir. Next caller. Okay, Mayor, the next caller is, um... Phone number ending in 932. Phone number ending in 932. You should be able to unmute yourself. Please state your name and address for the record. Hi, my name is Carolyn Towers. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Okay, I'm at 1534 South Hoffman Street. Good evening, Mayor Bagley, council members. I'm with you again tonight to talk to you about the traffic signal being installed at the corner of Pike Road and South Coffin Street. This week, I thought I would start outlining which codes, ordinance, and standards are being overridden in order to place this light at this location. I've decided to begin with the Envision Longmont Plan Growth Framework. Local street definition, functional priority, access only, limited mobility, continuity, no continuity is required, trip length within neighborhoods and business centers, traffic control, stop signs, this right here explains why there are no other traffic signals placed on a local residential street in town and explains why there are streets such as Missouri, Collier, and Meadow that have been dead-ended to protect the neighborhood residents from excessive cut-through traffic. 1.3a, neighborhood character. Work with residents to define and preserve desirable characteristics of neighborhoods. 2.1g, transportation facility design. Mitigate the impact of transportation facilities on noise, light, and air pollution, safety hazards, and aesthetics through appropriate traffic control facility design and site design on both public and private property adjacent to the transportation facility. Work with adjacent neighborhoods to balance transportation needs and facility design with neighborhood character when widening roads or constructing new roadways. Again, the use of appropriate traffic controls is defined by the standards and codes. The other issue here is that the city staff has told me is they never completed an acoustical analysis for the Pike Road Improvement Project. This project has potential for serious negative impacts to the residents in the existing neighborhoods, especially Southmore Park. This is a city standard that is required by all developers that are developing along state or federal highways, arterials, or railroad tracks. And the city did not think it necessary to do an analysis of how it would impact these residents. Are they exempt from their own standards? 2.2C, roadway system. Provide a safe and efficient roadway system that encourages the use of arterial streets for cross-town and regional traffic, encourages the use of collectors to channel traffic between neighborhoods and arterials, discourages the use of local streets for through traffic. 
The light at this intersection is allowing traffic to cross an arterial and travel through our residential neighborhood. It will also be legitimizing our street as a through street for commuters who get stopped by the traffic signal, endangering our children and general residential safety. 6.3 C, circulation and access. There are several items here, but I am highlighting this one that pertains to our residential street. Maintaining truck routing plans and regulations that use collector streets through industrial areas and arterial streets to facilitate access to Longmont's economic centers and corridors, and that minimize truck travel through residential neighborhoods. We see many trucks traveling our street to access businesses on the south end of South Cawson Street. With the traffic signal at this location and not on a collector street such as South Pratt Parkway, vehicles, including these delivery trucks that are well over the seven ton limit, will be going out of their way to utilize our street to cross over into Prospect. That is all for tonight. Thank you for listening to my concerns. Have a good evening. Thank you. Next caller. Mayor, the next caller. Let me just get there. Next caller, your phone number ends in 584. Caller 584. There you go. Please state your name and address for the record. Yes, uh, my name is Marty Pfeffer, and I live in Lafayette. Um, I uh, come to Longmont a lot, and I have friends that live there. Um, I am alarmed and disappointed that the city of Longmont is considering a move to convert the city's electric utility metering system to a smart meter, uh, advanced metering infrastructure. I am sensitive to uh, EMF, electromagnetic fields, and my health is adversely affected by overexposure to the microwave radiation with which um, smart meters and other devices operate. And I have greatly appreciated Longmont's commitment to keeping the analog meters in town. Um, a few years ago, I was considering, I was working in Longmont and saw all the meters on the streets and looked at them and realized they were analogs. And I, um, so I called the city of Longmont's uh, utility department just to kind of ask about the meters and I was told Point blank, Longmont will never have smart meters. Um, so I, <laughs> that sounded certain and enlightened and uh, was reassuring. So I'm wondering what has changed in the city's um, um, purposes. And um, I can't think of the right word. Anyway, um, U.S. military has long known that exposure is damaging on a cellular level, uh, exposure to microwave radiation and has strict guidelines for protection of its personnel that are much lower along with those in other developed countries and more protective than the levels approved by the U.S. Federal Communications Commission. It's common knowledge that the FCC's guidelines are long overdue for review and complete revision based on the advance of scientific knowledge beyond the lack of understanding of the late 1940s when they were created. There have been updates into the 1990s, but they're still inadequate and still clinging to post-World War II misconceptions that the only standard of measure of effect should be um, thermal or heating symptoms. Anyone who is the least bit sensitive, meaning they can actually feel their own body's response to exposure to microwaves, knows that heating is but one indirect and subtle symptom, if at all. The full effects are on many other levels that manifest themselves over time from cumulative exposure, even after removal from the exposure. It is a great miscarriage of justice and right practice for society that our local communities are so misinformed and misled by the federal direction and so, in good faith, blindly pursue such a risky path for the welfare of its citizens. Uh, I just would like to urge you to um, use the precautionary principle, which is that if there is any question at all and if there is any potential harm for any new technology, and there is massive amount of worldwide question, um, then all precautions should be made to go slow with caution until certainty can be reached with a lot of study and expert testimony, et cetera. And I, I would just like to reiterate. Um, all right, sir, uh, I'm going to have to cut you off because that's a little over three minutes, but we appreciate your, uh, your voice. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, next caller. Mayor, the next caller is caller's phone number ending in 370. Caller 370, you should be able to unmute yourself. Please state your name and address for the record.
Hello? Yes, please go Hello. ahead. My name is, <laughs> thank you. My name is Sarah Webb and I live at 1615 Grant Court. I am calling because um, there's been talks about changing the guidance for short-term rentals. I just wanted to quickly tell a little bit about why I'm a short-term rental um, owner in Longmont. I'm in the military um, and I purchased a home in Colorado because it's where I'm from. And I wanted to ensure that I would have a home in Colorado as rents um, and property values increase. Since I'm a military member and I will be deploying soon, having a short-term rental allows me to be able to pay my mortgage and not have to put my items in storage when I deploy, which I will be doing in February of this year. I've generated over $500 in revenue for the city. I've allowed a family looking for medical care to stay here comfortably. And I've brought tourism in from Lyons, Fort Collins, Boulder, other places where there isn't as much availability or it's more expensive. So I'm hoping that hearing more personal stories um, about why people have short-term rentals in the city will help you to understand why the permit process is already awesome. We're already permitted, we're already paying, we're generating taxes and revenue, we're bringing tourism in, but it also helps people who have different lifestyles than you may know of to maintain and keep their homes in Longmont. And I think instead of shutting it down or changing the program completely, if we could do things like say there's violations or police calls since we are permitted, maybe we can work on some kind of way to have those people who are violating or not being good stewards in the city of Longmont have repercussions while the people who are paying taxes, being permitted and doing the right things while also providing benefits to the city themselves and tourism aren't penalized for something like that. Um, I appreciate you listening and hearing my story and I thank you. Thank you very much. Next caller. Caller with phone number ending in 795, caller 795. Please unmute yourself and state your name and address for the record. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. Hi, this is Erin Spieth with Native Roots in Denver. We are largely in favor of this uh, rule to adapt delivery for the city of Longmont. But one revision that we would like to suggest is in 670-230 part I, which is on page 22 of the red lines in the packet for this study session. We would like to ask that the city replace the word city with the word state. This would mean that should additional jurisdictions opt in to marijuana delivery, nearby stores in good standing with the city and with the state could participate and continue serving Longmont patient communities. This would also allow those same stores to introduce new tax revenue to Longmont, which historically they haven't been able to contribute. In February, we surveyed 97 medical shoppers at our unincorporated Longmont location. They were asked, if medical cannabis delivery became available, would you use the service? Over 88% of people surveyed said yes, and this was pre-pandemic. We think that those patient voices should be at the forefront of the conversation around Longmont opting into marijuana delivery. In that same section of the red line, 670-230 part I, we would also like to see the inclusion beginning next year of marijuana transporter licensees by saying in conjunction with a state licensed medical marijuana center or marijuana transporter license with a valid delivery permit. This would allow stores to outsource delivery to a licensed transport and put Longmont at the forefront of the discussion around social equity by giving stores the opportunity to partner with social equity licensees who have historically been denied the opportunity to partner in the industry in a meaningful way. So that's why Native Roots uh, supports Longmont opting in to marijuana delivery. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next caller. All right, Mayor, next caller's phone number ends in 418. Caller 418, you can unmute yourself and begin speaking. Caller 418. 
All right, Mayor. I'm. Oh, there we go. Please state your name and address oh, for the record. Yeah, uh, I'm Stan Cole. I'm a long-term resident of the city of Longmont, and the reason I'm calling is because um, there seems to be this thing of throwing together an ordinance uh, against people living in um, uh, uh, our, you know, vehicles and RVs. And, you know, I kind of have a feeling that, you know, you're doing this in a pandemic when most people, particularly people that are living in uh, vehicles and RVs, they don't have power or internet ability to get hold of people. And to get on the city council, it's taken me like four months to figure out how to do this. Um, and so I got a couple of questions for council. Um, you have this anti-living in RV ordinance. How many residents did you involve that are living in RVs in the discussion of this ordinance? Does it, can anybody answer me that? Anybody on the council answer how many uh, people living in vehicles were brought into the process of this ordinance? Stan, we, we don't, we typically don't, we don't answer or, or respond to questions. This is your time. This is your three minutes to say whatever you want. Well, well, I, I think the answer, I haven't gotten any answer to that. Um, the other thing is, is that uh, I don't think anybody that's been living in, in vehicles was even contacted. It's sort of like if you had something where you're shutting down a bunch of businesses along, a, uh, along let's say, a street, and you don't contact those businesses, I don't think that, I think you're required to at least inform people that there's something going on that's going to in, influence them. The other question I have is that I, you're supposed to, people are supposed to have a notice and then um, a notice that they can have a hearing and before, let's say, their vehicle is impounded. Um, I have something at, in, the, in the municipal court, and I think people there have been informed about that. I've asked for a hearing because I've been getting these notices threatening to impound my vehicle, and then I'm not getting a, a notice where I can have a hearing on that issue. And I think Mayor Brett Bag Bagley asked about, you know, what, what's the requirement? Well, that's, um, I think it's um, Jim Matthews or something like that. I'm having a little trouble reading it because all of a sudden, it, you know, I don't have any light where I'm at. Stan, but, uh, unfortunately, Stan, that's just over three minutes. We're going to have to cut you short, but thank you. Always yeah, enjoy hearing from you. I've been trying for five months to get out on here. Five months. Well, this is I, the first time I've been through here. Well, that, that well, you, and, you you can call back in next week for your three minutes. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that you're doing legislation without Stan, allowing people to have public comment. Stan, Stan, if you want to call back in on the second reading or call back in next week with your three minutes, that's fine. Okay. But we, we, we cut uh, everybody off at three minutes, but thanks. Okay. Well, I want some answers to my questions. All right, we can you, we, you can reach out to any council member and, and we can take this offline, but thank you. All right, next caller. Mayor, the last caller, uh, phone number ends in 148. Caller, your phone number ends in 148. Please unmute yourself and state your name and address for the record. Hey, good evening, everybody. My name is Adam Cole, and I'm also another Native Roots representative alongside my call Aaron, uh, colleague, Aaron Spees. Um, and kind of my tenure with Native Roots, you know, my most recent two years, I've acted as a customer experience uh, manager in addition to a project manager. And, you know, first and foremost, like, I would like to echo Aaron that pre-pandemic, we did an internal survey of 97 medical shoppers in our Longmont facility and 88% point something were in support of this. Again, pre-pandemic. And can everybody hear me just for confirmation? We can hear you perfectly. 
Okay, wonderful. Um, so, you know, with that pool, granted, the sample size is not incredibly large. It's under 100. But having an 88% plus buy-in before traveling and being exposed to public places became a nationwide health concern and mandates by the CDC are starting to restrict people and their ability to actually go out in public. Um, I can only imagine, and I think everybody on this call could fairly assume that if we did that same pool again, that 88% would increase um, just, just out of the concern of public safety. And, you know, one thing I'd like to note, we currently are the only licensed dispensary in the state who is currently providing our medical member patients with marijuana delivery services. We've been engaged in this practice since about late March slash early April. I can tell you that I personally facilitated the very first delivery in the state of Colorado. And I'd like to provide a little bit of the patient testimonial here to really outline that this conversation about medical delivery for patients is in support of patients. And this gentleman, diabetic, did not have a driver's license, predisposed conditions, and he, take, he took public transit to get everywhere. Well, now with COVID, this individual can't take public transit. He lives alone, has no family in the state, and it was a godsend for him, for me and a colleague to be able to walk up, knock on his door with his order, and provide his medicine for the next month. And he's, you know, he's like, I've been praying for this for years. And, you know, that's just, that's just one case story. And I'd like to provide another one just to give another concrete example of some of the ways that we're impacting lives in a positive fashion. Um, example number two. We have a homebound patient that lives in a nursing facility. And given the nature of COVID and the, and the state of the pandemic, these individuals that live there are not allowed to leave the ground by any means. And she's been a longstanding patient of ours, but with COVID restrictions, she no longer had access to the medicine that helped alleviate her pain to improve her quality of life. Now, does everybody have the same experience in cannabis and get that relief that really does make their day better and easier to operate? No. But we have thousands and thousands of anecdotal and right in front of your face examples of where it has helped improve the quality of life. So that was just another one where we were able to operate compliantly. We showed up to the nursing facility. The patient themselves handed their ID to the receptionist while we had a line of sight to the patient. Because in terms of ID verification, you need to make sure that, hey, the person on the ID is who's getting this product. Receptionist handed us the ID. We verified the person standing behind the receptionist, handed the product right over to her. Very smooth transaction. And she makes an order once a month to have a monthly supply of medicine. So she's not having to, you know, Sir, I'm meet us most recently. I'm going to have to cut you off. Yep, you've, you've, you're, we're quite a bit over, but we appreciate your comments. Thank you. Um, you know, thank you, thank you all very much. And, and you know, I'm just going to close with, Public safety has not been an issue. We've invested in camera vans that have uh, dead bolted safes inside all of these vans. We have GPS tracking showing every step of the way. We only carry out limited inventory. We're never leaving with a bunch of cash. So in we, terms we, of best practices- we, we, got, we, get, we, we got it. I'm gonna have to cut you off, but thank you. All right. Okay, totally. All right, thanks. All right, that concludes public, first call public, actually our only call public invited to be heard because it's our study session. Let's move, everybody doing okay? All right, so let's go ahead and move on to our COVID-19 update by Harold. Uh, Mayor, Council, based on time and the other items we have on the agenda, unless there's any specific questions about numbers, um, I'm not going to go into the graphs. I'm gonna ask Sandy to talk about some of the programs we have. The one thing I did wanna point out is that the current five-day average percent positive PCR is at 1.7, and the overall average is down to 4.14. Um, the numbers have trended up a little bit, um, but they haven't hit the most recent peak um, on a daily basis when we were at approximately um, close to 25 cases in one day. Um, if council wants to look at those graphs, um, I can show them or you can go to the Boulder County website. I didn't get the update from Jeff Zayak today, but as soon as I get it, we'll send that to council. I do see one question. All right, Mayor Potem. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Uh, just a quick question. As I see it reported in the paper, uh, they report the Boulder County numbers and then they separately report the university numbers. Are they specifically breaking those out or are they including uh, those in the county they're, numbers? They are including those in the county numbers um, in terms of the university. And so what we, what we can tell you today is, so Boulder now has 879 cases and Longmont has 773.
which are now over 100 in terms of what we've seen, but they're supposed to be including those in the county numbers. Okay, it just they didn't make it clear the way they reported, so I was just curious how they were counting them. Thank you. Yep. All Sandy? Right. Sandy, yep, yeah, you're up. Hello, Mayor Bagley and members of council, Sandy Cedar, Assistant City Manager. Uh, one of the conversations that I saw over email with council members was really asking about what are the things that we're doing today to help folks. I think council member Christensen asked this question along with the request about the Broomfield Ordinance, information about that. Um, so I thought I'd just share a couple things. I did send a flyer to the city council on Friday that kind of went through some of the different pieces that we're um, in the middle of assisting with. So I'd like to share my screen for just a moment and show you. This is the flyer that I sent you. It was both in English and in Spanish. Um, and I just wanted to go briefly through what's happening in order to help people through this pandemic. So first and foremost, our partners at Boulder County have just been phenomenal being able to offer all kinds of programs. Some of this funding does come from the federal CARES funding uh, that has been directed into existing services similar to these things like rental assistance and mortgage assistance. So if people are struggling with their rent or struggling with their mortgage, calling the Boulder County Housing Helpline is the right answer to be able to access some of those funds. On the utility side, we do have about 1,700 households at this point that are to the point of shut off with their utilities if we were shutting off. Obviously, we're not doing that and we're also not accruing late fees or any of those types of uh, fees for utilities. But in the meantime, what we've done is we've taken that list of households and we actually have a few staff members who have been willing to call each of the households to try to get them hooked up with the Energy Outreach Colorado funds that the R Center has been granted. They've been given $100,000 to be able to help people to pay for that utility assistance. And we understand that if they use that funding, there may be some more behind it also from the CARES funding on the federal side. So we're trying to make direct contact and really help people, Carmen calls it a warm handoff, to try to make sure that they understand how to fill out the forms and that they have some assistance or the liaison in order to help them get those utilities paid. The other thing is that we have all kinds of other assistance that we have on our website. If you go to the coronavirus relief fund uh, relief page, you'll be able to see all sorts of tabs that say, how do I get help for my business? How do I get help for my for child care, et cetera, et cetera. And we have all that information on the website. Happy to take any questions. Mayor, I think you're on mute. Thank you, ongoing efforts, appreciated. All right, okay, let's move on to uh, study session items, number 6A. Uh, let's start with the possible code changes to allow for medical marijuana delivery. Good evening, Mayor, Don Quintana, City Clerk. I'm just gonna pull up our, we have a very brief presentation for you. Um, the bulk of our uh, content was in the uh, packet. But just to review um, what is before you tonight, um, we're looking for direction whether or not to bring back ordinances that would make these changes. Um, so the first uh, section of changes that we brought forth, Mayor, um, I believe you directed us back in June to bring back medical marijuana delivery in light of the uh, COVID pandemic uh, to allow people to receive delivery of their uh, medical marijuana. So we have drafted uh, some changes to our code that would allow that. Uh, basically, we, um, sorry, let me back up for a second. We do have various staff members with us tonight in case you have questions. Tim Hole, City Attorney's Office helped draft these. Michelle Sebastian from the City Clerk's Office, our Lightning Licensing Coordinator. Also, uh, two of our Master Police Officers, uh, David Kennedy and Sarah Arney are here um, to also answer questions uh, if you have those. So um, apologize for forgetting to mention that. Uh, basically, the medical marijuana uh, legislation that is drafted and before you in your packets um, would follow statutory rules. We uh, provided a link to Rule 3-615. They're very comprehensive rules and cover things like uh, inventory tracking, record keeping, verification of the patient, um, one of the callers spoke to that, in fact. Uh, the three uh, differences that we included were, were to make sure that they adhered to Longmont store hours um, in keeping with um, the storefront, so that was fair. Uh, we included a requirement at the suggestion of one of the uh, licensees to require a body cam recording for deliveries for extra security. 
Um, and then also at the uh, recommendation of one of the, the um, licensees was the prohibition of use of an offsite storage facility to fill orders, thereby requiring that orders are filled from uh, a store within Longmont. We did limit the, um, the allowance to just licensees licensed by City of Longmont. I think um, Ms. Uh, Spies, who spoke from Native Roots a bit ago during Public Invited, her one suggestion um, was to change the word from city to state. That would change who can deliver within city limits, and that would be a good question um, for you all. The way we have drafted it would only be allowed, delivery would only be allowed by a licensee licensed by the City of Longmont. Uh, at this point in time, we have one licensee who has a medical uh, license, um, but we do have four total licensees. Again, Native Roots, as you know, is not one of those licensees. They sit just outside our city limits. Uh, and finally, we did not, because of the very uh, limited scope, because we have so few licensees, we did not recommend a permitting process. We thought, you know, as long as they're licensed by the state, um, that that would probably be sufficient. So, um, Mayor, do you want me to pause there and discuss delivery, or do you want me to keep going? We have two more slides. No, keep going. Keep going. All right. The second change is why we were in code um, that we are bringing forth for you uh, to consider um, our changes to Chapter 6.70 and Chapter 2.68 to adjust the wording um, to change the secretary role, uh, secretary of the Marijuana Licensing Authority and the Liquor Licensing Authority. Uh, as we got in there and started uh, really closely looking at code, we uncovered that the secretary, uh, as secretary to the authority, really sits under that legal umbrella and can't ask questions of the city attorney's office when receiving and processing applications. That's troublesome for us. Um, so we've drafted wording to correct that. We don't envision much. We, can, we envision that the clerk's office would continue to do the bulk of the work other than... Um, the authority would designate a secretary who would post the agenda. Shouldn't We don't envision that taking much time. We would keep the work, uh, but fix that legal issue. So that's that guy. And then um, also while we were there, a couple other changes. Um, the authority asked um, under 6.70.180 to add um, the opportunity to allow the Marijuana Licensing Authority to administratively approve modifications instead of being obligated to set a hearing. The reason for that is because um, code says that in, any of our four licensees who modify anything uh, from their first application must come through the modification process. Sometimes that's a little cumbersome. We had a licensee recently switch from packaged sale to um, deli style sale, and that, that required a hearing. If the judge had the opportunity to, or the authority, I should say, had the opportunity to administratively approve after reviewing everything, that could make that more a little more nimble. Um, and then we also updated 6.70.100B3, or suggest updating that, um, just to clarify that a marijuana applicant um, does have the right to request that their application be put forward to the authority, even if our office says, for example, we, we feel like your application is incomplete or insufficient. Um, that they could go ahead and ask us to put that before the authority and, and let the authority make the decision. Um, we do that anyway, but that provides uh, good clarity. And then lastly, um, as you may or may not be aware, the state changed to a third party vendor for fingerprinting a couple years ago. Our police department, police departments no longer provide fingerprinting services. That's outsourced, so you're just catching that update while we are at it. So that is all of the presentation we have. We um, are happy to answer any questions and would need direction on whether or not to go forth with delivery, medical delivery, um, and with our other code changes. And uh, lastly, just noting we did not bring forth uh, recreational delivery because overall the comments were kind of negative to that. So if you would like us to consider recreational delivery, we'd be happy to bring something back, but we are not prepared for that. All right, can, you, can we get, there we go, all right. Um, Councilmember Christensen. Sorry. Um, Dawn, thank you very much. I think this, uh, this was surprising to me because as I read over, I thought that the 
all the marijuana industry um, um, suppliers and stores would be really gung ho for this. But they brought forth a lot of um, really detailed explanation about why this can have all kinds of <sighs> repercussions because they are a highly regulated industry and this seemingly puts them out on the road with some guy driving along with a load of marijuana. <laughs> you know, that doesn't sound too good. But I think you addressed um, most of their issues. And I thank you for th doing that very in a very thoughtful way. And I also appreciate the fact that you um, took a look at the, the, the authority and the authority's secretary um, and straightened that out. I wasn't aware of that problem that she couldn't um, consult with the city's attorney. I mean, she's here in our office, not over with Judge Frick. And, it, and she's dealing mainly with paperwork and contracts, and it would be so much easier to be able to talk to the district attorney's office, I mean, the, the city attorney's office. Um, so I'm glad you straightened that out. The question I have is, what is, what is um, our policy for delivering medical drugs? If, if say someone has diabetes, uh, or they are um, in extreme pain and they uh, have um, stronger drugs, such as um, not heroin, but when people are dying, they get some very, very strong drugs and they're in no shape to go get them, um, nor are there caretakers really. What is the policy of getting drugs delivered that are regular drugs, you know, not marijuana? Because it's to me, this should follow the same uh, policy for medical marijuana delivery as we have for any other um, prescription drugs. So what is the difference between this system? I, I don't know, I've never had any I don't take very many drugs anyway, so I don't know what the policy is on being able to have them delivered. Mayor right. Magdalene, Council Member Christensen, I, I don't honestly know the answer no. about pharmaceutical delivery. I don't know if, Tim, you have any idea. I don't know. And I guess, bring it back. I, I, I guess that's a great, great question, but let's, let's try, tonight we're just looking at the, I, I'm gonna actually make a motion. I move that we direct staff to proceed forward um, pursuant to the slides that we saw on medical marijuana delivery. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. There's a motion on the floor. Are there any other comments pertaining to the motion at hand? <laughs> Councilmember Christensen. Well, this is an opportunity to discuss it. I think it would be useful to discuss it, but Oh, well, we can discuss it. I just got the motion okay. out there so we can so we can that we can do exactly that. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I support that. I'll second it. Oh, it's already been second. Okay. That's right. Councilmember Martin. Um, I just have one question, given that, uh, I mean, we did have two local providers be not in favor of this, but of course, uh, there's, the ordinance doesn't say that they must provide this service. It says that they may provide this service. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, one of them mentioned an alternative, and I'm not retrieving the word. It was either a caregiver courier or a caregiver deliverer. Um, that is that that a, a, a private person associated with the patient would have the right to pick up and uh, a supply at the store and deliver it. Uh, can can we hear a little bit more about that? Because I'm kind of in favor of going on with. Uh, what Mayor Bagley says, but I'd, I'd like that cleared up first because it's, it's just the question of whether the alternative is reasonable or not. Councilmember Martin, I believe you're speaking to the caregiver uh, transport that, that was mentioned in one of mm -hmm. the licensee's comments. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim, do you know more about caregiver? Well, I believe that they are allowed to designate, Tim will need to correct me if I'm wrong, designate a caregiver who could then but it has to be designated on their um, metric file or their file. Um, and that person could, you know, pick up product for them and deliver it to their home. But one person, um, I don't believe you can have more than one on your file. 
Is that accurate, Tim? Am I capturing that correctly? That's more, than, more or less accurate. This is something that's already in place. Um, so you can designate your, your, your caregiver to go uh, pick up medical marijuana for, for you at the store um, and, and bring them back. Um, they have some specific rules around that that are in the, the rules. Um, but, you know, it is a viable alternative that, that it currently exists. Um, it, it's pretty straightforward. You, you designate your caregiver and they go in and pick up for you with the proper identification. But this, just, just to be clear though, even if, but if somebody, that's great if somebody has a caregiver, but if somebody doesn't have a caregiver, what this ordinance would allow would be for allow those medical marijuana patients to get delivery of marijuana in their home. All right, any other questions? Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Mayor Backley. I just want a clarification on the transport. Um, and you may have already covered this, but when we are talking about transport delivery, are we talking about um, like FedEx or UPS or what kind of transport are we talking about? I'm, I'm a little confused on that. Tim, do you want to answer that, Tim Hull? Mayor Backley, members of the council, I realize I forgot to introduce myself, Tim Hull, Assistant City Attorney. Um, so are you, if you're referring to the comment earlier in the evening, um, that was about a, a transporter license. It's a specific class of license that um, previously mostly was transporting from one facility to another facility. Part of the change they made in, mm -hmm. in delivery um, was to allow people who have a transporter's license um, to partner with a medical marijuana facility and be their transporter. Um, so they are separately licensed um, and both would end up having to get a delivery permit from the state. And so, so essentially, yes, it could be a service that they, that they contact with. I know some people are looking into um, various uh, services like Drizzly or, or some other service um, which transports alcohol um, or Uber. So I guess my question, just to follow up on that, um, let's just take Native Roots, for example. Would they have their own employees be the uh, delivery service to their customers? Or would they contract that out? I'm, I'm a little concerned as to where the fuzziness comes in who is going to be handling this, pro this product. Mm -hmm. um, that's really important. Uh, and that's where my transport question came in. Uh, is the facility itself responsible for the delivery of this product to someone's home, or are we going to third party contract it out? Mayor Bagley, Council Member Peck, um, Tim, I'm, you're welcome to jump in. I think the medical marijuana transporter license would be a third party um, business that they that they contract with to deliver to their patients. If you use uh, just a caregiver, that's of course somebody you personally designate. Right. And under medical marijuana delivery, um, they they need to be an employee of the of the licensed uh, facility. And just to be clear, Native Roots is not one of our licensees, so they would not be able to deliver as this is drafted to to people in city limits. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. That anything you want to add, Tim, go feel free. If it clarifies the, the standard setup for a medical marijuana delivery permit would be an employee of, of the licensee. Okay. Um, but there is an option to partner with a medical marijuana transporter licensee to have a third party be the person who does that for you. Okay, thank you. All right, we have a motion on the floor to uh, direct staff to move forward with the presentation comparing an ordinance which would permit delivery of medical marijuana um, inside Longmont. All right, let's go ahead and take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much, Tim and Don. Let's move on to 6 B. Thank you. And it's a Lama Housing Authority. Harold, tell us what's going on with LA. Oops, sorry. Uh, Aaron Rodriguez, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Just wondering if staff needed a, a motion for the other two pieces about uh, the authority and the secretary oh. position. Good point. We would love that clarity unless, unless we are to imply that 
that the direction the motion was intended to be go forth with all of that okay or all the ordinances as drafted that, that, that's what i intended baron just to be clear once you go ahead and make the motion and we'll move okay. forward thank you <laughs> thank you uh, i move that staff also move forward in preparation of the ordinances to clarify the role of the authority versus the secretary second second yeah all right all in favor say aye aye aye, aye. aye. Opposed, say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. Thank All you right, very much. there, extra clarified. All right, now let's move on to the Longmont Housing Authority operations. Harold, tell us how you haven't screwed it up yet and what happened. Uh, Mayor, Council, um, before I start out, I just want to let you know that um, on the um, on the item today, I do have Kathy Fedler, um, Karen Roney, and Cameron Grant, who is uh, the current chair of the Longmont Housing Authority. Um, once we get through the presentation, I will turn this over to Cameron to add his thoughts. The one thing I wanted to say is one of the reasons we wanted to put this on the agenda today is we have presented this to both um, both boards, the Longmont Housing Development Corp Corporation uh, and the Longmont Housing Authority. We've also uh, presented this to all the staff of the Longmont Housing Authority following that presentation. We gave them a few days to digest the information. We then went back to the board to get feedback. And we went back to all of the various work groups within the Longmont Housing Authority to give them a chance to ask us more detailed questions. Um, before I start the presentation, I do want to say that um, I really need to express my um, sincere gratitude for all the staff um, with the Longmont Housing Authority and with the city of Longmont that has been there to support us through this transition. Um, our city staff has been phenomenal in this in terms of diving in and trying to figure this out. Uh, the Longmont Housing Authority staff um, have been great um, in, in working with us, uh, listening to what we have to say and buying into this concept. And, and so really for us, this was an opportunity to, to lay the path forward in terms of what we have to do. You all, um, had or received a copy of the report. Before we go there, when this originally started, um, the chair and vice chair of the Longmont Housing Authority, and Cameron can talk about this in more detail later, approached us and we began working with um, Jillian and Longmont Housing Authority staff. Um, and as we started this process, we came up with um, a staff vision of what we wanted to accomplish. And what you really see is integrated partnership leveraging resources, building a continuum, um, opportunities for our community members in need, which we have to continue to underscore through this process. That is what a housing authority does. Maxify, maximize efficiencies and effectiveness, be, have a sustainable model, and ultimately we want to create something that other communities want to replicate. When we went through the first presentation and we talked to both boards and staff, one of the things that, that we really came to is in fact, our community needs a successful and sustainable housing authority. And at the end of the day, failure is not an option. Um, when we look at the numbers that we have in the housing authority, um, we have over 400 units um, where uh, folks live. Um, many of those units are fully supportive services. Um, and we also have in excess of 400 vouchers that we provide. Um, I may have missed that number. Kathy can correct me if I'm wrong. And that actually allows us to house individuals in private apartments um, and rental units. Um, and so that is a significant impact in terms of providing affordable housing to our community. And what we learned is based on where we were and the issues that we were seeing, we couldn't risk that for our community. Um, as we began working, I know we've talked to you all um, on occasion when we brought the first IGA forward. Um, as city staff, we went in and we, we worked with the Housing Authority, our teammates at the Housing Authority, and we did our own analysis. We then brought in BSH strategies. Um, that is really Betsy Martins, who is the former um, Housing Authority Director for B Boulder um, Housing Partners, um, which is the City of Boulder's Housing Authority. At one point, it was part of the City of Boulder, then it became its own structure. Um, and we asked her to come in and analyze the current organization, looking at do we have the optimal positions? 
um, for the size of our housing authority, what do we need in terms of support and training needs, and then suggesting an ideal structure. We also asked her to, to do a brief analysis on the financial condition, look at our property operations, talk to us about best practices, um, and create a compliance calendar tool. Um, what we were really happy with um, in terms of the work that we did is the things that we identified for both the Housing Development Corporation from now on, you'll hear me say LHDC, or the Housing Authority LHA, um, the work that we did early on, I think we were pleased with the fact that there was a lot of uh, common components in the work that we did in the work that Betsy did in terms of the review. It really for us was an opportunity to get someone that had um, experience in a housing authority to either affirm or tell us where we were off and some of the conclusions that we came up with. Um, when we look at positives, there is the ability to have some patience in rebuilding. Um, and I stress some based on, on what we're seeing and where we are. Um, the assets are in good shape. The facilities are good sh in shape. We have um, a strong balance sheet today um, and there's reasonable performance in the portfolio and balance sheet. You hear me say today, and as we talk about today, you're gonna hear some things come out in the presentation when we really start looking into the future and sustainability. Um, and when we talk about the assets are in good shape, they're in good shape today. You will see us when we talk about facilities, really talk about the need for a comprehensive capital improvement plan and an ongoing operation and maintenance plan for the, for the structure. Um, you know, with those positives, there's challenges. Uh, the organizational structure um, is a significant challenge. I think as we continue working and understanding the financial components of this, um, that is coming more to the forefront. Staff capacity and lack of tools to do their job, you will see this throughout the presentation. One of the things that I've talked to both boards about and the staff and the housing authority is one of my primary jobs um, as city manager and now in the capacity of the um, executive director or the, I forgot the exact term they used to call me, is, is really to give um, the staff in both organizations a tool, the tools that they need to be successful. Um, and what I will tell you is that's not necessarily the case. Um, it literally, in some cases, was as basic as people not being able to have a computer, someone doing financial work where they could open up multiple spreadsheets, the computer would crash. Um, I you know joked about it earlier, um, but as we were talking to some of the staff in one of the meetings when we were doing it via WebEx, um, their system crashed. And so we had to wait for them to go to one of the city facilities. Um, another challenge um, that we saw, and it was also consistent in the audits that were presented to the board, was really a lack of financial controls and management analysis. Um, and we do have some uh, operations in 2019 that were producing neg negative cash. We are seeing that change and 2020, um, but again, we wanna ensure that that's sustainable. Then we have opportunities. You know, one of the things that we look at is really how do we define roles, responsibility, structure uh, for the organization? I think that's one of the things that we've seen in this is really that it's, there's not clear role definition in terms of what people do. Um, and, and so at times that creates a lot of questions and chaos in terms of who's doing what. Training is something you're gonna hear me continue to say. Um, we really need to amp up the training for the staff so they, they know how to operate in, in the HUD environment with all of the requirements. Um, again, consistent procedures, standing, standard operating procedures and protocols in terms of who and what, what people need to do. We need to provide them the equipment. Um, and then, you know, probably, and I probably should have put this at the top bullet, is really a productive staff culture. I think one of the things that we've seen is that there, um, if you look back in time, um, I think the culture of the organization um, really hasn't been conducive um, for staff to do their best work. And so that's one of the things that we spent a lot of time on is talking to them about our organizational culture and our attributes that we want and how we want to work with each other and how you build team. If you can do that and you can really strengthen that culture, 
um, then it gives you a lot of opportunities in terms of the structure. And then finally, uh, resident empowerment as we move through this. Um, we do know um, that, that we have issue, uh, that we have different concerns and, and we really need to work in a way that Carmen works in neighborhood services with the neighborhoods in our community to really work on resident empowerment. In that, there were some base recommendations that came forward and I'm gonna take these in, in different components. But one on the financial side is um, we need to fill the account position with a qualified CPA. Um, I will tell you as I was briefed on some budget issues today, um, there are some things we need to work through on that one. Um, we need to create a monthly closing process. For many of you all that seems, um, you know, why wouldn't you do it? They were actually closing on a quarterly basis. I think the challenge that that really brings forward is that when you have a, a situation that may develop that you would catch in a monthly closing, by the time you actually catch it, you've lost a couple of months in terms of being able to deal with the situation. So right now we have staff working and trying to do that. Yardy, you will hear Yardy throughout this presentation. Yardy is really their financial, their management system that they use um, to, to manage the housing authority operations. Um, and we really need uh, more Yardy expertise and, and in terms of training and what we can do with the system. One of the things that we found is when they implemented Yardy and brought it over, it probably wasn't, um, as you transfer the data, uh, wasn't all transferred into the system. We, you know, we have an example of where they're still using the shadow system, the HMS system for some of the old data in terms of the housing choice voucher program. And so we really need to make sure that we're using that system. Um, it is uh, the ideal system um, for um, housing authorities. As we talked to Betsy, one of the things is this is such a powerful system uh, that there may have been a little bit of overkill in terms of what we needed within LHA, uh, but definitely we can use it. We just need to train, 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 and, and, and fully explore, you know, the power of that system. The other thing that we learned, um, and this was really a comment about um, two positions that are now vacant within the Housing Authority, both the CFO and the Housing Choice Voucher is real, manager is really um, going in and getting um, LIHTC, so that's low income housing tax credits and funder and investment training for those positions so they could move through this. And then at this time when we presented this, um, we said staff recommends hiring a financial firm specializing in housing authorities. I will touch on that a little bit later in the presentation. Finally, or not finally, there's a lot more to come uh, on the property management recommendations. Um, one of the things that, you know, we saw and that uh, Betsy saw is we really need to create a defined strategy for property management. Um, and we need to create um, a team. I'm going to skip the second bullet point. Um, and well, now I'm going to go back to this. Let me go back to the first one. Really, what is the strategy and how do, how do we as an organization want to approach property management um, and it can be as basic as, you know, some things that we've asked to be put in place of standard office hours so that the residents of communities know when the community managers will be available um, and really consist, create a consistent standard um, operating procedure across all properties so that, um, you know, as folks talk about it, we, we've run into issues where they say, well, they do this in this property, why can't we do this in, in our property? And we really need that consistency across um, every property. Um, you know, we do have a vacancy in the maintenance tech position that we need to fill so we can stay on top of it. Uh, and then we need to really work to create a team-based environment between the community managers and the maintenance techs um, so that they're operating within their, their functional areas but working collectively with each other and solving um, and addressing the needs of each of the individual properties. We've also said um, we need to hire an asset or community teams manager. That wasn't a position that was filled. Um, and so I think that tended to lead to properties operating under, um, operating independently of each other and, and limiting the consistency 
um, that you need across all of the, the properties. And then you see the, the scheduled office hours as being something more basic that we wanted to do. In terms of the housing choice voucher program, so for those of you that are, I mentioned this earlier, is so there's two components within the housing authority, provide actual housing, and then administering the housing choice voucher program to get people into other properties that are for rent. Uh, the, the piece on this that I think is important to really clarify, when you look at the revenue streams coming in, one, you get it from rent, two, you get it from developer fees, and that's really part of when you build a unit, they pay fees for the management to the housing authority. And then the third piece of um, generating revenue is through the HCV program. Um, we know that we, you know, we were seeing that we had some vouchers available. Um, we need at least those up immediately so we can increase the revenue stream coming into the housing authority. This is an intensive paperwork process. So we know that there's probably an administrative assistant component we need. Um, and then we need, again, training for the HUD HCV forecasting tool. Um, Karen and Kathy and I believe Tracy have the opportunity to work with HUD on this. And what we found in that is that we actually had 40 vouchers available to us. And so those are 40 people, 40 units that we can house for people that need it in our community. Um, eventually, you see already again as a consultant and training component within the HCV program. Uh, and then eventually we need to look to how do we move this into more a paperless program. That being said, we always know that we're gonna have, at least for the time being, people who can't operate in that. So there will continue to be a component of this um, where we're gonna to need to have the paper program. And then the other recommendation that we talked about is hiring an H uh, housing choice voucher consultant, specializing in this so we can stabilize it quickly and lease up the vouchers as soon as possible. Again, I will uh, touch on that component later in the presentation. On the administrative side, um, what we're really starting to see is that we need to consolidate the back office functions, information technology, human resources, purchasing, um, and, and risk management. When I talk about that, when you look at the size of the organization, as a housing authority, it's not a small housing authority where they have limited number of staff, but it's also not a large housing authority where they have ample staff and have ample revenue. So for many of the things that they had to do, you were finding uh, people um, taking on those roles, even including potentially the executive director um, who didn't necessarily have that expertise. Um, and so we feel like consolidating those back office functions within our structure will really bring an economy of scale to what they're doing. Um, we need to expand and redefine the role of the executive assistant really um, to take advantage of the skill sets there and fill some gaps. Um, once again, you're seeing solid procedure manuals and increased training on the staff. Um, and then finally, to sit, decentralized decision-making. Decision-making um, in the housing authority was very centralized at the top of the organization. Now, ideally, um, you do want to decentralize that and get it into its appropriate levels. But before you can do that, we have to develop those solid procedures um, and really get the training where we need to. So that's going to be an incremental process that we have to go through. What have we done to date um, in order to um, really provide more consistent oversight across all of the properties? Michelle Waite has been placed um, in the role of community manager and oversight. oversight. Um, we have received quotes for financial and the HCV consultants. Um, we are, are diving into the financial side and, and looking to move forward with that. What I can tell you about the housing choice voucher consultants, uh, from the time that we made the or original presentation to where we are now, um, we really feel like in terms of the work that Tracy's been doing and Kathy, we have a pretty good handle on that. And if we want to use those consultants, uh, we would probably use them more on an hourly basis in terms of training and asking questions. But you know what we realized in getting that quote, um, one of the lowest options we got was um, um, slightly over $20,000 a month for their services. Um, so we really felt like we needed to um, 
um, continue on the direction that we're on in terms of the work that we're doing and really approach it on an hourly basis because of the cost. Um, we are continuing to work on consolidating back office operations. Um, our ETS department has done a phenomenal job in getting us a transition plan um, and they're working with Nextlight on that. And then we also have our facility maintenance staff working to identify an optimal structure and assess the facilities. You know, one of the things that we found specifically in the Aspen Meadow project, um, as we were working on that rehab component, when we looked at some of the other facilities, we were seeing things as basic as air conditions going out early. I mean, those uh, at Spring Creek and Fall River, Spring Creek especially, that's, that unit is, um, I believe, five to six years old, and we were seeing air conditions go out. Well, what we realized is the specs for those air conditions are really more along the lines of hotel air conditions that were designed for intermittent use, not ongoing use that you have in an apartment type situation. And so what we've been able to do is bring facility maintenance in conjunction with Molly O'Donnell, who works in Kathy's area, to really spec what we have um, to ensure that we get um, a longer life expectancy out of what we're putting into those facilities. So we're already starting to see some of those benefits of bringing everything together. So this is what the organizational chart looks like today. Um, you see me here, um, Karen's in this area looking at staff development, residential services, um, and the cultural trans transformation that we're working on. Um, Kathy and Tracy are looking at operational oversight. Um, the development world. And when we talk about development, we're actually talking building the project similar to Spring Creek and Fall River. Um, on the financial side, um, you, you see Kendra, uh, Deanne, and Susie. Deanne and Susie are from our financial department. Jim's in there as well. Um, and then our housing choice vouchers, you see Tracy and Kathy. Um, and, and, and in there, in all of the dark, you see different people that we're putting in um, to, to help us as, as we're moving through some of these issues. So, if, when you read the report, um, Betsy recommended an ideal structure. Um, the one thing that we realized um, when we talked to Betsy and we went through the report is that we know that that ideal structure that she recommended is not financially sustainable uh, based on our current model. If you remember, I talked about the revenue sources coming into the housing authority, specifically housing choice vouchers, rents, and development. Um, and so when we look at those things, we knew that the structure that she was recommending would have meant that we would have had to change the structure again once we got through a couple of years based on the financial pro uh, projections. So we began developing structures that would allow us to evolve over time. Um, and then when we looked at the structure question, and we talked about this with the board, is really the reputation of the organization to recruit individuals with the, the skill sets that we need. Um, I think it's important to just understand, you know, what we've, what they, what we have encountered over the last few years and, and how significant that reputation can be in terms of determining whether or not people want to join your organization. I think something for me that came out as I was talking to staff is, you know, someone said directly, had I known what it was like, I probably wouldn't have signed on the dotted line to become part of the organization. Um, the great piece of that is they're choosing to stay as we move in this. And if you, you read in that report, I think one of the things that they're, um, and I don't want to put words in their mouth, but they're appreciative of that they talked to Betsy about is the work that, that we're doing and with them is from the city's perspective. So what we looked at is a transitional model in terms of, you can see the consolidation of the back office functions. Um, you can see facilities. Um, and when we talk about security, we're talking about security systems and custodial moving in this world. One of the things that I realized in conversations that we had a few weeks ago is it is not uncommon for the housing authority to need things like concrete work air conditioning work, um, security systems. In many cases, they are getting quotes for that immediately or they are producing their own bids. 
So there's really not the economy of scale um, in terms of the volume that they have. And we really think there's an opportunity for us to reduce the ongoing operating costs by tapping into some of the bids that the city has in each one of those functions. And our bids are desi designed to do that. Um, you do see community services um, in this because one of the things that, that we've realized is there's a lot of synergy and a lot of opportunity as we look forward. So we need to keep community services connected into this, but then potentially looking at a deputy director um, that would still work for me. Um, that, that really has the finance, housing choice vouchers, and regional property management in place. Um, again, you know, when we show you these structures, uh, they're always subject to change as we're looking at it. And, and what's going to be driving a lot of that is, is really what do we need to put in place? And, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the positions. Um, one of the things, and I've added this slide from when I presented to the board, to then say, so when we hit there, what are we trying to do? Well, what we're really trying to do and what we're working on now is rebuilding the foundation of the organization. Um, and you can see, you know, what we would consider basic components to an organization. You then really need to hire critical vacant positions. We're talking community managers, maintenance techs, the accountant. We then define the roles that you heard us talking about. And then at the end of the day, we're really evaluating leadership vacancies in the long-term structure. One of the things that I'm quickly realizing in this is when you look at the structure of the organization and, and you look at how it was developed, I think um, a lot of resources were placed, um, what you would consider at the top of the organization. And I think in many ways, in, in what, we're, what I saw in the budget today, it really, um, hampered putting people where their boots were on the ground and really serving the residents um, in these communities. And so for us, you know, that's gotta be our focus you know, as we move forward. We really think that that first model, um, a version of that first model needs to be in place for 12 to 18 months. Part of that is when you have an organization that has gone through this much turmoil and this much change, you got to stabilize it and you have to keep it stable for some time. We then have a couple of options. Um, one option is, is if we can solidify the financial structure, accelerate the development, increase the housing choice vouchers where we, we have enough revenue coming in, we could theoretically consider um, if that deputy director is at the point where we think that they can fill um, a more formal director role, we can look at a, a more traditional housing authority structure. The key in this is you still see the city connected to it in terms of those back office functions. Another option is really fully embedding it within the city structure. Um, and, and you see the financial piece moving into our financial world. You see the back office functions. Um, you see facility maintenance integrating with each other. Another component that we've added that is frankly through all of these models is our public information team and communications. One of the things that we know we need to improve, improve on and we need to continue improving on is how we communicate with the residents. And that also has to be consistent communications. And I think uh, Steph Bergman and Marika have done a good job in helping us when we need to communicate. Um, I'm gonna talk about community services. Um, uh, in a little bit on the next slide. And then you really see that ex executive assistant um, working with me to try to keep all of these things tied together. Um, the next slide is where you see us really breaking this down in with our existing community service structure, where we're really moving all of the compliance components in uh, and combining those both with what we have within the structure and with LHA. Um, the grant funding piece, our inclusionary housing and development coming together, the development from the Housing Development Corporation with inclusionary housing. Um, and then that direct deputy director would then slide into a, a, a manager position uh, that really looks at the housing choice voucher program and the regional property management. Um, again, all of these have a lot of synergy. The one thing that we have identified is in terms of development in the future, um, I don't think we've done a great job um, in really how we partner and how we take advantage of all of our programs. So no matter what structure we move into in the future, I think 
um, keeping that connection in with our inclusionary housing program is going to be fundamental as we move forward. Then there's another question coming forward, and that's really the housing authority and the housing development corporation board model. Um, you know, originally when the, when we first went went through this, they were their development was was in separate corporations. Um, and what we know is that really strains the resources because you have staff managing two boards, managing multiple sets of financials, and it really just adds to the workload. But part of the reason that was done is because HUD really didn't like to see the development arm and the housing authority arm being within the same structure. Um, HUD's changed their perspective on that, and you can look at um, Boulder County Housing Authority and where those two things are together. Um, we also think there's an opportunity um, in moving in that direction to leverage our, the other development programs uh, that I talked about earlier. Um, and at the end of the day, that really strengthens the balance sheet of the overall organization. You see the board's thoughts, they've started to have conversations and, and look at what that means. And then we talked about the timeline. So, you know, we've hit the point where we had the initial IGA with the city. Um, we said an immediate needs addressed. What I can say is we are addressing immediate needs, but we are still seeing immediate needs come up. Um, so we're still in that. We really targeted six months to have a new operational model as we're moving forward. Uh, within the, the first 12 months, you'll see additional financial and structural changes. We kind of outline that for you all. We evaluate as we're going through the process. Uh, and then we start making decisions. And there are different variables that we're going to be looking at. And when I've talked to the board, we may learn something in two months that very clearly points us in a direction. Um, but those are things that we're just going to have to, we're going to have to be in a constant state of evaluation as we're moving forward. Um, and so that's where we are today. And let me stop sharing my screen. Uh, that's where we are today. One of the reasons I wanted to present this is because the board um, really was in alignment with what we talked about and the recommendations that we made. Um, I needed to, to give you all a chance to look at this and comment on it because as we move forward, we're moving pretty fast on certain things. And, and I did not want to get out ahead of the council because there will be IGAs coming to you in terms of services that we provide. You heard me talk about information technology. That's an incredibly important IGA that we need to move very quickly on uh, because we, we have the potential to use CARES funding, but we need the IGA in place in order to use that to really um, fund infrastructure required with our IT system. Uh, so at this point, um, kind of what I said to the Housing Authority and the Housing Development Corporation, I just really downloaded a lot of information on you all in a very short time frame. Um, you all had a chance to read the report. Do you have any questions for me? Um, I've, got, I've got one, Harold, and that is, it would be nice to know that chart that showed all the organizational structure that has become the responsibility of your city staff do you have a number for what that will cost the city in its budget? We're putting that together right now as we're also looking at what, what they're doing. Yeah, um, so, and, and, so. and part of that is because different positions have different impacts. Um, in some ways, COVID has allowed us to um, ask people to work on certain things just because their work has changed. Um, and other people, we've just added to their workload. So it's different for different positions. Um, and, and we kind of have that in, in another document that Kathy made a run at earlier for the board in terms of the amount of hours that we're spending. Okay, so just get that to us as soon as you can. All right, uh, Council Member Christensen and then Council Member Peck. Uh, okay. So, um, Mayor, I would just like to point out that once again, that the money that this is costing the city will be probably coming from the money that's in the Longmont Housing Authority budget 
for the director that isn't there anymore and the, the accountant that isn't there anymore and various other things. So this is not necessarily coming out of our general fund. But anyway, um, Harold, I, this is the third time I've seen this and every time I, you add to it and every time it's better and every time I learn something new. Um, I, um, I wanna thank you for all the work that you, Kathy, Karen, Molly, uh, and all the other people in, on staff have done for this. It's just, it's amazing. And it is, um, this morning uh, we had a special meeting and uh, Cameron uh, Grant, who's the uh, chair of the board said, well, the city jumped in with both feet. I think they thought maybe they were diving into the deep end instead of the abyss. <laughs> um, I thought that was an appropriate way to put it. I would urge you to um, merge the LHDC and the housing authority with the city because it would add enormously to the transparency, to the long-term vision and being able to develop use development and um, um, just a lot of efficiencies and uh, fiscal uh, savings could happen, I think, with that. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Mayor, if, if I can, before we go, I've got on a roll <laughs> um, and I forgot to bring Karen, Kathy, and um, <laughs> Cameron in. Um, I definitely wanted to bring Cameron in. Um, he is the, the new chair and I wanted him, many of you may know Cameron, I wanted him to introduce himself to you all and, and give you his thoughts uh, and then let Karen and Kathy uh, talk about anything that I may have missed in this presentation. Cameron? Sure. Well, well good evening. Um, uh, parallel echo uh, what council member Christensen said about the, the, that report I've seen now three times and it has uh, improved every time and I pick up new, new things each time. Um, uh, so uh, Mayor Bagley and members of the council, first of all, thank you for um, letting us spend some time talking about the housing authority here tonight. I am confident that when you began 2020, you didn't anticipate the housing authority being on your agenda as often as it has been. Uh, but I'm appreciative that that uh, that you've been as accommodating as you are. I, I, I wanted to go back and just cover a little bit of the history leading up to when we started this process with the city. Um, you're pretty familiar with a lot of it, but, um, but I think it's important to touch on a few things. Uh, as you probably know, we had a very significant leadership change in the Housing Authority about two and a half years ago. Uh, and at that time, um, we changed our executive director. We went out and in search of finding a replacement executive director. We began the construction process on the new Fall River project. Um, and then we brought in Jillian. Uh, and through Jillian's tenure uh, of about two years, um, she, she came in kind of eyes wide open, but didn't have any idea what she was getting into. She helped us uncover uh, what we've discovered is a sy systemic problem with the way the housing, housing authority is, is set up. It's working, it was working okay at the time, but we knew it wasn't sustainable. Uh, based upon that, in February, we, we came and sat down with Harold and some members of the staff to start having discussions about where we might want to go with the housing authority because we saw some need for some fundamental changes in the way we do things. And we're exploring the possibility of some sort of alignment with the city. We didn't know what that would look like. We just started the discussion in February. Uh, then uh, I think our last face-to-face -face board meeting was March 11th. Um, on March 12th, we got a notice that Jillian had accepted a job running a housing authority in Connecticut. Um, Thankfully, she did stay with us through May to help with this transition, but it was a you know, pretty abrupt change of course for us at a, a fragile time. Uh, and then on March 16th, we were all subject to a stay-at-home order. Uh, so not only uh, did we have the challenges we walked in the door with, we were dealing with a whole new set of challenges. 
Um, and then not too long after that, our uh, chief financial officer took a different job. So some very dramatic changes uh, that in the midst of COVID um, really took a, uh, uh, an organization in need of some significant change and put it on very thin ice. Um, thankfully, we had already started this discussions with the city. We quickly came running back to the city to say, hey, we really need to have these discussions. Um, and to our benefit and to the benefit of our residents, and I think to the benefit of the cause of affordable housing in Longmont, um, Harold and his staff leaned into this problem instead of leaning away, and, and we started working on a solution. Uh, and, I'm, and I don't want to just focus this on Harold. The council and, and the city in general leaned into this problem, and that's, that's really what has uh, enabled us to, to do what we've done to date. Um, you know, so, so what have we done today? I think Harold touched on some of the things, but I wanted to talk about some successes that have happened since March. Um, we finished the Fall River Project, successfully opened it, and fully leased it. And so, so think about this. We have a brand new project ready for tenants with not a single tenant in it. COVID hits. You can't even leave your house. How are we going to lease up this community? The city... We, our playbook didn't didn't have an answer for this. The city's team came up with a plan, uh, leveraged the relationships that the city has with a lot of uh, organizations in the region, and we leased that thing up in less than you know less than 45 days, somewhere in that range, uh, which was uh, absolutely a lifesaver for us. Uh, by the way, that facility was also given the 2020 People's Choice Award um, from Housing Colorado. You know, yes, we are kind of here reaching out for help, for help, but we do some pretty spectacular things here in town as well. Um, at a different project, Aspen Meadows, before this hit, we were in the middle of the financing of a much needed rehab of the community, about a $5 million project. Um, when they learned that our executive director was leaving, our investor left as well. So we, we lost our ability to do a needed $5 million rehab for our residents. Um, the city stepping in saved that rehab and we just last week got, a, got financing approval with a new investor uh, to, to make that happen. And that's gonna be significant for the housing authority because it will uh, improve an asset that we hope to hold for the long term. but where it'll really make a difference is for the residents of that project who are going to have a, a pretty significant upgrade to um, the facility that they live in. Uh, and then, I, you know, I, I think kind of lastly and most importantly to me, um, you heard Harold, Harold use the word turmoil, and I think that's, that's appropriate. Uh, there has been a lot of turmoil in the housing authority. There's been a lot of turnover at the staff level. Uh, it's been stressful for the board members, uh, but generally speaking, I want to say I think our residents have weathered this without a significant bump in the road. I think you know, that is really what our focus has been, and the involvement of the city has allowed us to take care of our residents in a way that uh, uh, I, I think does the city proud. So on behalf of myself, and on behalf of my fellow board members, the staff of the LHA, and I think most importantly, all uh, the, the families that we support, I just want to say to the council, thank you. Um, you. You dove into this without any commitments or promises from us, other than knowing that we're, we're all kind of going the same direction and uh, we couldn't do it without you. So thanks. Thanks, Cameron. All right, so Harold, um, uh, other than the presentations, what do you need from us other than um, your update? So I wanted to give Kathy and Karen a chance in case I missed something. Kathy, um, Karen, did, has Harold missed anything? Kathy, let's start with you since I don't see Karen's picture. <laughs> um, no, I, I don't think that he missed anything. I just would like to add how wonderful the Housing Authority staff have been to work with. They have jumped right in. They have switched processes in the middle. They've put up with, you know, a whole bunch of city people coming in and asking them questions and telling them what to do. And they take it in stride and 
um, they are really committed to the work of the housing authority. So that is, um, is really great to see. And then I also want to um, throw out a kudos to um, city staff who have jumped in. Anyone that we have asked for help um, or called and said, I'm working with the housing authority, they, what do you need? What do you need? We've got Deanne and Susie that are spending full weeks at the housing authority helping us understand um, the financials, um, facilities, ETS, next light. It, it's been phenomenal and something that um, as city staff, we can be really, really proud of. Um, and then the housing authority board has been extraordinarily um, supportive as well. So that's all I wanted to add. Karen? So, um, I don't really have nothing else to um, add to what you just heard. I think, um, you know, other than the, uh, the incredible power of um, the LHJ team and the city staff team coming together um, and working um, tirelessly and relentlessly toward a very important um, vision and purpose and, um, and, ser and serving our community, making sure people who need housing the most have access to that. So. Um, so anyhow, it is a uh, it has been a challenge, but it has been um, it continues to be rewarding each and every day in um, in the work that we're doing together. Yeah, I think there was a couple of questions, Mayor, from others, um, but but to to say this, I think to say that we weren't afraid as we started jumping into this would be the understatement of the year. Um, but I think the interesting point is it's the power of team and it's the power of culture um, and, and what you can really accomplish when you come together. And, and we talked about this with the housing authority staff. It's, it's okay to be afraid, understand your fears, and then become fearless. Um, and I think that's really the piece that, that has, um, you know, since COVID, people inspire me daily and how people have responded to this has been amazing. Um, because at the end of the day, one of the most important things we can do is take care of the most vulnerable people in our community, and that's via the housing that the Housing Authority provides. And, and how do we take it to the next level um, and, and really become, you know, better than we are and we work towards something that's greater than us as individuals? All right, Councilmember Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I think this was a wonderful presentation. It's really given me an idea of the scope of what you're taking on. I had some idea before, but I would like you to just say a few words or, or Karen or Kathy or you know, whoever feels best qualified to say this um, because we're getting you know, questions from the public that said, well, why don't you just hire somebody? And why does it need to change? It's always been this way. And we want the city working on city stuff. And I would just like somebody to acknowledge the additional bureaucratic bu burden, the special financial skills, the special regulations, all of that stuff that makes this not just another property management organization so that the public will understand clearly. I'll start off on this one. I think first and foremost, there's um, when I say we could have done better historically is really done better in terms of the relationship we had with each other. When we look at what you all have done through inclusionary housing, what we have in, in the community development funds, it's, you know, how can we leverage that to a higher level so we can accomplish more? Um, you, you know, by, by I think you, you heard me talk about reputation. Um, and, and, and so I think part of that also comes into play of you know, honestly, this is this was this is a monumental challenge, and and I think what Jillian learned is they just don't have the capacity to do it within their existing structure, um, and so it would be hard for anyone. Um, you know, when you look at it, um, and 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 I've talked to you know when we were in floods and doing all of that, Karen and Kathy and I were working on DR funding and all of this we haven't probably talked as much as we've had in the last six months, it's daily, um, and everyone diving into it. 
when you then look at the complexity of the financing mechanisms and you talk about the capital stack of when you're trying to develop these projects. So when you're layering in tax credits, uh, so you have the tax credit investors, you have banks, you then see us bringing in CDBG funds to this, it then becomes an incredibly complicated um, capital stack in terms of how you're, you're building um, uh, these apartments. Uh, and, and so I think it's a culmination of skills that we're bringing in to move through this. Um, you know, Kathy's been phenomenal in that world and Molly. Um, and so it's a different beast. And um, I think that's what makes housing authorities challenging. Um, it's not the first time housing authorities have been through this. Uh, won't be the last time. Um, but I think it really is the complexity, the amount of work, and then the limiting resources, and then what you actually have where you're able to do it. And so that's what we're really trying to work on in maximizing efficiency and freeing up um, dollars to, to, to staff appropriately. Karen, I see you coming in. Yeah, I think the other thing that I would add to that is that, um, and, and Cameron mentioned this in his uh, presentation, is that you know we learned earlier this year, and we learned from Jillian when, um, when, when she and the board really came to the city and said, you know, um, we, we really have some systemic issues that need to be looked at, and we just don't believe that we have a sustainable path ahead of us without some major rework. And I think we learned from bringing Jillian in to an, um, an agency that was really struggling with a lot of systemic issues that we needed to address those, those systems, look at the systems and, and really try to strengthen that and right in the ship, so to speak, as we, before we bring in a new executive to be able to then really take the agency and, and move forward with that. So I think we learned a lot from what's happened in the last two years with the housing authority that, um, that it, was, it was time to take a little bit of a different approach and um, work on some of the systemic issues to help really um, build a path for success for the next um, director that comes in to lead this effort. I would also add that in my mind, this is city business. We have city funding in every single property um, that the housing authority owns. Um, we have fee waivers that we have put into it, CDBG funds, home funds, um, our affordable housing funds. Um, and that if, if we cannot sustain this organization and lose the housing and the investment that we've put in, this absolutely is city business and where we should be um, putting our resources and our time and our efforts. I think to add to that, you know, I think one of the, the main things that any city needs to do is, is, is work to um, take care of the most vulnerable in our community. Um, and that's what this housing does. And you can't lose this housing. And as we look at the 12% goal and what we're trying to achieve, we have to build upon what we have. And so when we talk about affordable housing and what we're trying to do, you have to secure that. And, and, and for me, I think that's foundational to what we have to do and, and to ensure that we have a successful and sustainable housing authority, not 10 years from now, but 50 years from now. All right, let's go with Joan, then Polly. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I, I, I wanna say I'm really proud to work with the city that has such expertise and dedication uh, in our staff and that Harold, Kathy and Rick Karen, you can never retire because um, we need you. <laughs> but uh, along with the revenue that, that Mayor Bagley asked for, the, what the revenue would be, uh, I'm sorry, not the revenue, the expense that the city would incur taking on this. Can we also bring back the revenue from uh, the Longmont Housing Authority that would offset that. For example, uh, you mentioned that the CFO was no longer there. So that pay the executive director, uh, what the difference between having LHDC be a separate ent entity uh, versus LHA to bring back all the revenues so we can see what the offset would be. 
I think it's really important for the questions that we've been getting from our residents uh, as well as to um, how much is this going to cost the city and just to be just to explain it a little better. I think give that you, would... to give you part of the answer and, and we're still flushing through the numbers, but um, we have a report, at least for this year, um, we think there's about 196,000 available for this year. Um, you know, we're working through some of the um, COVID funding that they have so we can really understand what that looks like. Uh, that's just on the housing authority side. We haven't really uh, dove into the LHDC side yet. Okay, thank you. Polly? Um, so I, if there are any people watching who are in um, uh, Longmont housing units, I want them to know uh, because I think that many people are uh, wary and afraid of what might happen. Um, I want people to understand that this city, the city staff, the city council, the board of Longmont Housing Authority, the employees at the Housing Authority have an absolute commitment to continuing this. If we did not have this, there would be over 400 families and we have something like a thousand vouchers in addition to the units that we have, it would be a disaster if we had to close these units. This is an absolute commitment to people who are um, low income. That's the purpose of this, is to provide decent housing for low income people. And a lot of low income people are disabled, they're elderly, they have um, mental problems, whatever. They, they, are, they need housing. And it is our job as a society to help them find this in an efficient way and in a way that makes them feel respected and uh, gives them a dignified home. And there's nothing really more foundational, as Harold said, to uh, um, our society and our town than that everybody's treated with dignity and respect. So I want people to understand that they're not, they're, they're safe in their homes. Thanks. All right, Dr. Waters. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Um, uh, because I have a chance to serve by both by this council and as a voting member of the Longmont Housing Authority Board of Commissioners, uh, I've been through those conversations with Cameron and other, other uh, LHA commissioners. Um, and for uh, Council Member Martin mentioned some of the incoming uh, both emails and commentary we've seen in, in public or in, in news sources. Uh, so for, you know, those who care about the very uh, uh, population that Council Member Christensen was just identifying uh, and, and, and care about housing uh, for, for every citizen, but especially the population that LHA serves, I just want to go back and, and, and touch on a, a, a couple points Cameron made. Uh, this all unfolded. I, I know some of the input, as Councilman Martin has said, why haven't you just gone out and hired a director? Why is the city taking this on? Because everybody who's in this picture from the city had full-time jobs before council, before LHA came knocking. Uh, I'd be curious to, to learn who's hired, who's done big recruitments of executive directors during COVID with travel restrictions and no gatherings of more than 10 people, et cetera. You simply can't go to a legitimate recruitment process under those conditions. And with the financing of, of Aspen Meadows and the, and the leasing of, LH, or of uh, Fall River, the stakes were, were extraordinary for the organization as well as for the 462 or the residents in the 462 units. So I, I would turn to Harold and ask, uh, how many critical city responsibilities or functions have you or Kathy or Karen or anybody else from the city staff, how many things have you dropped? What, how many balls or plates have you let drop? Um, I'm pretty sure. Probably, you, you know, I think what we've done is try to stay on top of everything that is our core responsibility for our jobs. We may not have done it as fast as we wanted to, but you know, trying to stay on top of everything, COVID response, budget that we're trying, that I'm gonna present next and 
in the work we're doing. And many of those people were working on all of those things. So any, for anybody who's let listening, things drop. nothing drop. The city's done its job under a pandemic as they've kept the housing authority and its residents moving forward in, 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 in secure housing. It's an extraordinary, in my opinion, it's an extraordinary act of service uh, on behalf of the, the community that, that the city of Longmont staff members, some key people, and there, it, it's, it's, it's the it's Harold and Kathy and, and Karen and a few others, if you think about sacrifice, they're the ones that have sacrificed because they just added this on top of their jobs. So um, the relationships are complex, the issues are challenging, and I, there will certainly be public commentary. But if, if people are gonna comment, they at least ought to be informed about the complexity of this, the demands and the stakes, because the stakes for a large number of this, it, people in this community were very high. And, and without what's happened, uh, the, 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 the prospects for the housing authority would be pretty dire. So I, I wanna add my thanks to Harold, to Kathy, to Karen, and I know uh, Molly and you know, you, you, you've provided that list of names. Um, I hope the community, as people are prone to make a comment about this, for some would occur to them to, to say exactly what Cameron said, and that is, thank you. Yeah, I, go ahead, Harold. Well, I appreciate your comments. I think it's the entire organization. Um, you can't place a, a value on the support team all over the organization when I go to Sandy or Joni or Dale or Jim and, and ask people to do things. Um, you know, it's an organizational effort. And Harold, uh, just in conclusion, I just wanted to echo everybody's thoughts. Um, you and your staff are doing this above and beyond what your heretofore or, or, or prior responsibilities were. And I only asked the question that I did earlier of um, how much is this costing is because I plan on, I mean, I imagine council, we, we are all anticipating charging LAJ and requiring them to reimburse the city. So um, as we, we talk about uh, dollar figures and responsibilities and whatnot, not just for you, but your staff, um, that was something that I wanted. But thank you very much for, for superhuman and heroic efforts regarding our LHA. So before we go on to 6C, the presentation- I will say, go ahead. we're gonna be pushing IGAs through and you're gonna see multiple IGAs as we continue to move through this. Yeah, we look forward to it. So before we move on to study session item 6C, the presentation of the proposed 2021 operating budget and the 20 through 2021 through 2025 capital improvement program, um, let's go ahead and take a five minute break. And Harold, if you could just, uh, during the break, talk to your staff. I'm not telling you to rush through anything, but just make sure it's efficient and expedited given that it's 9.45. Alrighty? Cool, back in five.
you very much. Uh, we're going to resume the uh, September 1st, 2020 study session for Longmont City Council with item C and study session items, presentation of the proposed 2021 operating budget and 2021 through 2025 capital improvement program. Carol? I am I'm gonna share my screen with you all. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to let you all know is so we were going to, the, the capital improvement presentation is fairly lengthy. And so we wanted to make sure we could spend the time on that one. So we're actually going to move that to another budget session um, so we can take the time we need to on all of those projects. Um, Mayor Council, as required by charter, um, we're going to, we're presenting the budget to you all tonight. Um, in the virtual format, you will you will get the um, document from Teresa and Jim, and uh, and they will provide that to you today. I'm going to give you an overview of the budget, um, and then as we move through the next few meetings, um, we will um, have specific discussions on various topics. Uh, Jim will will join me in the end, hopefully, and give you a sense of what that schedule is going to look like. We are moving the capital improvement plan from tonight to uh, another meeting. And you are seeing the slide, correct? We are. So yes. um, today um, we are presenting you all with a balanced budget with no tax increases. Uh, the total operating budget is 371.7 million. It is 17.8 million more than 20, the 2020 adopted budget of 353.9 million. Uh, that's a 5.05% uh, increase. I know you all are seeing that and going, well, we've been talking about the economic conditions. We're gonna explain, I'm gonna explain that as we move through. Um, all funds are balanced with sources of revenue to meet those projected expenses. Um, the budget does include um, the 5.9% increase in electric rates and the 9% increase in water rates that council has previously passed. Um, Approximately 39.6 billion in accumulated fund balance will be drawn down in 2021. Um, and that's primarily to meet the capital needs. Some of the significant projects that you're gonna see in the capital improvement plan, um, advanced metering, a 7.5 million. I think as we look at the, the resolution that the council passed in terms of 100% renewable by 2030, this is a critical component to being able to operationalize that. Um, the price part tank replacement, um, for those of you who aren't familiar, it is uh, the big tank by Sunset Park, 19.2 million. We all have talked to you all extensively about Nelson Flanders and the work that we have to do there. We also have wastewater treatment improvements that we need to make in order to comply with a lot of the mandates that are coming down. And then one of the items that you all have talked about, um, railroad quiet zone, so that's the 2.17 that we're going to come in. You will get more detail on that as we um, go over the capital improvement plans. Um, the highlight, and this is where I said we're going to really show what we were we were dealing with. Um, the proposed general fund budget for 21 um, is 88.09 million. That's actually a decrease of 3.9 percent. You can see the amount there. Um, the decreases in one-time expenses uh, from 4 million in 2020 to 1.2 million in 21. Um, in terms of the ongoing expenses in the proposed general fund budget, um, it's only increasing by $7,670 over 2020. It's essentially a flat budget. The one issue um, as we were looking at the general fund that we were getting into is when you look at the financial policy uh, that we have in place in terms of cost recovery for the recreation division, and then you look at um, how we're forced to operate based on uh, the current COVID restrictions um, and, and, and how limited we are in, in certain facilities. Um, as we began evaluating uh, the rec center component of that, we um, projected a 25% decrease um, in revenue within our, our recreation um, budget. Um, as, as we looked at that, um, 
you know, this is really the classic example of what we're dealing with in terms of COVID today in the sense that there's a tremendous unknown in terms of what it's going to look like in 21. We are obligated to bring you a balanced budget. So we reduced the rec um, revenue uh, by 1.13 million. Um, and the way we're going to have to deal with that is we're going to have to reduce contract and temp hours um, within the rec budget to manage it. Um, so council knows um, as we were going through the budget process, I, um, we did say that as we had to talk about these issues, um, they would hear it from me. So earlier today, I, I did have a team's call with the recreation division and talked about this. What it's gonna look at at this point in the budget process um, is essentially a 25% reduction um, across REC um, with, uh, with the exception of full and part-time benefited positions. So we're not gonna adjust those. Uh, there will be a 30% decrease in, in our temporary hours. And, and as you can see in this slide, we're really hampered by just how many people we can bring into a facility, um, how often people are coming into facilities. Um, and we honestly just don't know what that future is gonna look like. To give you an example of what we're seeing in a, in, um, a rec center, um, normally we average slightly over 1,200 um, visitors a day. Um, we have been around, I think the number that Jeff gave me was um, 269 a day uh, coming into the rec center. So we th there are multiple things coming into play. What we can actually do in those facilities in terms of the COVID restrictions how people are going into those facilities and ultimately that is affecting their revenue. What I will tell you today and what we told staff is that's what we know today. Um, as we said throughout this process, we're gonna be evaluating this on a monthly basis. Um, things could change on us. Um, and, and if things change, we, will, we are hoping to position ourselves in this budget to uh, respond very quickly. Um, and so in terms of specific programs, what we're really asking staff to do is to look at what we're doing, how we're doing it, look at those where we can maximize revenue um, and make a dent into this. You know, one of the things that we're talking about that we just don't know is as we get into colder months um, and people can no longer um, exercise outside, um, we may actually see a swing as people come in um, in the colder months. So. This is gonna be one of those areas that we're gonna continue watching. The entire budget as we're moving through this, we're still gonna continue watching on a monthly basis. Um, so there's no, in terms of highlights at this point, um, we don't have any increase in pay ranges in the proposed budget. Um, open range uh, employee compensation is budgeted at 101% of market. Um, we are asking human resources to gather um, 2021 market pay data and pending our revenue performance, um, we could assess consideration of one-time payments or market adjustments in 21, but that's really gonna be dependent on the financial performance that we see over the next few months. Um, no guarantee on that. Um, the proposed budget does include step increases for step employees. So when you, you look at that, it is fire police and electric because they're on a step system. It also includes uh, people who are open range employees who are below their current market and allows them to move to market. And we also were able to keep in exceptional pay for employees who meet criteria and delivering the extraordinary performance. Joanne will have a presentation on, on, on these aspects uh, later in the budget process. Um, but as you know, um, on the exceptional pay side, that's one of the things that, that I review all of those nominations uh, that are coming through. Um, I'm not gonna go over this. This is um, council vision um, for people, um, but what we wanted to do is break that out and then talk about what we put in place. Um, so we did include $50,000 uh, for the early childhood related to the outcomes of the summit that you all had. Um, we included 22,000 of one-time funding for the library digital and print resources. What we were really seeing, and this is really one of those interesting components that's related to COVID is based on um, how people are having to move through education 
and what parents are doing, we were definitely seeing more of the demand. This is something over time that we'll have to look at um, moving into ongoing. Um, and, and many of these things, I know council talked about it and we're gonna talk about it later in the budget process in terms of social equity, you're seeing many of these things starting to, those were the lenses that we were looking at in making some of these decisions. Uh, we also know that we needed to continue 10,000 of ongoing fo funding for our language line services. So for you all, um, if we're unable to have an interpreter, the language line actually gives us the ability uh, to call that number. And so we can have an interpreter that we can use via uh, the phone. Um, we did include $9,500 of ongoing funding for meal programs for uh, the youth of our community. Um, again, another example of great work, uh, our uh, youth group, um, community and youth services, they're working on a pretty big grant that we can hopefully get on to deal with meals programs. Um, $107,000 um, in We've increased the human service needs. You know, we all were planning on increasing that annually. Uh, we've increased that by 107,000 this year. Many of these things we're also looking at augmenting potentially through CARES funding. Um, we finally got guidance. I was gonna talk about that in COVID. We, we were getting clearer guidance. And so over the next week, we're gonna be evaluating CARES funding. And then we also needed to push 100,000 of ongoing funding uh, for the administrative costs associated with affordable housing and CDBG in terms of what we need to do. Um, your vision for places. Um, in terms of what we're really talking about there, um, you know, we are moving uh, in ongoing funding for Engage Long Lot. We found that we've really found value in that communicating uh, with our community. You can see the money that we're putting in for the air quality monitoring that actually comes from oil and gas revenue. Uh, same with the 60,000 uh, of one-time funding for plugged and abandoned well investigations. Uh, the money that we have for the Emerald Ash Borer. Um, we do have 200,000 of one-time resources for energy efficiency improvements at city uh, facilities. That uh, really is tied in with the work that we've been doing from the Climate Action Task Force and our sustainability program. Um, and then 7.5 million of one-time resources for advanced metering. Um, so when we look at this and we talked about um, some other highlights, uh, you know, this was something where um, I think I've been in a city manager's office and trying to remember 97, the, you know, over 20 years. This has probably been the, the most interesting budget that we've had to go through, and, and you'll see this in the budget message, in terms of really just trying to figure out what that revenue number is going to look like um, months from now, based on the condition that we're in um, and, and the uncertainty that still exists. And so there were many times in this where um, Jim and I were flip-flopping on each side of the equation in terms of are we being too conservative in our revenue estimates or are we not being conservative enough? And we, you know, Jim um, being the, the genius that he is, you know, we just really started looking at the data and said, well, what do we think we can do? Because what we didn't want to do was go in and make cuts that were unnecessary, but we also didn't want to add things and create a, a situation for ourselves that was tough to recover from. So we, we used a projection of 1.85% above 2019. And I wanna be very clear on this, above 2019, it's still almost 1% below what we budgeted in 2020. Um, you all will remember us talking about the property tax. Um, when we were talking about the budget last year where we said we were somewhat concerned about the potential for a, a recession and we didn't wanna allocate that into we made the recommendation not to allocate that into ongoing funding. So the 21 budget does benefit from what that 1 million of property tax from the 2020 budget that was earmarked for one-time expenses. You know, what we can tell you is we're gonna have to continue closely monitoring all of our revenue streams so we can react um, quickly when we need to in a way very similar to how we move forward in this budget process. As we look ahead, um, you know, 
this has been a really interesting conversation for us. We know there's a number of short-term economic risk. We know businesses haven't opened, others won't reopen. Um, you know, if you watch the national news, we're seeing bankruptcies by retailers. It's not uncommon these days. Um, you know, in all of this is really the concerns with the possible resurgence of the virus and what that really means. Um, if you if you listen to health officials, they're very concerned about what happens over Labor Day and what happens in September because um, they really think that that will talk about what the fall will look like. Um, and then as you look at um, all of, if, if you look at any number of um, financial article, um, whether it's CEOs, whether it's financial advisors, you know, they're really starting talk, to talk more of the potential of a recession, or in some cases worse, and, and actually using, um, as I'm saying now, the D word um, in terms of these uncertainties. And then the other thing that we know in a more long-term perspective is we know next year um, Gallagher Amendment will impact um, the impact projected for 2020 due to the valuations of the businesses being affected by COVID-19, you know, have the potential to reduce uh, revenue um, are over 2.1 million to the city or 10% of our annual property tax. So we also know that's something that's potentially coming to the future. So what we tried to do in this budget is, is take the priorities that we know that council has presented to us, um, take what we think is a, a, a comfortable level of risk um, and, and, and really also set ourselves up so we can handle um, another situation in the way that we were able to move through it this year. Um, at the end of the day, you know, the thing that I've talked about with staff um, almost every Thursday when I have a citywide Web WebEx meeting is the only thing certain that we know today is that things are uncertain. And, and so what we really tried to do is provide council with a budget that allows us to continue to provide the services that we have historically provided to our community in a way that hopefully we've mitigated the risk. Or as much risk as we possibly can is really what I should say. Um, that is the end of my presentation. Jim, do you want to join? Did I miss anything? Did I overstate anything? Uh, Jim Golden, Chief Financial Officer. Uh, no, but, well, you overstated something about the way you describe my, me, I think. But beyond that, <laughs> I think everything else was about what we were uh, planning to present. What I wanted to, to do at this point is tell the council that, that uh, uh, we, when you get your budget, and Teresa will explain uh, how you'll get that in a few minutes here. But when you do have that, you'll notice at the end of the budget message, and it's a, it's a rather long budget message, but um, at the very end, we do include a schedule as we do every year. The schedule is a little bit different. If you've been through the budget process um, in the past, you uh, may be remembering that we typically will do our resolutions and ordinances that need to be adopted related to the budget in October. Uh, we do that, especially during uh, council election years to make sure that we're de dealing with that before the election. But uh, this year that uh, we do have some twists, uh, the, the, um, the county assessors have um, a different deadline now for getting us the preliminary assess evaluation Instead of August 25th, when they normally would provide that to us, they have until October 13th. So we do want to make sure that we are aware of that before we are presenting an ordinance uh, to the council. So our, the first reading of the ordinance, instead of being on the 13th, like it normally would, we'll be doing it on October 27th. And then the second reading will be on November 10th. And that's all within our our charter schedule requirements anyhow, so we'll be okay as far as meeting those deadlines go. Uh, we still, even though the county did have some change in their requirements due to COVID, our, we still had a September 1st deadline to, to um, provide this budget and CIP to you all. So you'll be getting the budget, the CIP, and the pay plan tonight. Uh, the uh, schedule, we will move that CIP 
We do have a, a lot of play in the schedule because of the fact that we have that extra Tuesday now and could go uh, a little bit farther out with our presentations into October. So uh, we will uh, assess the other business that's on the council's uh, meetings coming up in the next few weeks and see where we can fit that CIP presentation back in. It's a long presentation, but it, you know when you're looking at the budget that we have this year and our limitations in, from an operation perspective, a lot of, of the efforts that we do want to bring to your attention are in the CIP area where we still did have a lot of, uh, of fund balance and things to uh, vote towards capital projects. So we want to make sure that gets its due time. So we'll, we'll make those adjustments as we go along and update you on when we'll get them to you. But I'm thinking the CIP will be in later September, towards the end of September. So with that, I'm going to ask Teresa to explain to you uh, where you'll be able to get your budget. Hey, uh, Teresa Malloy, budget manager. So logistics. Um, in the past, we have provided uh, the budget, the CIP, and the pay plan, as well as uh, the uh, council communications and all the attachments that go along with it in your Dropbox. With the new PrimeGov uh, agenda management system, um, you no longer do use Dropbox. So this year, we are gonna be putting that um, information out there on the city's website for you. Um, and we will be directing you to the website to access the, the documents. Um, and then um, each council communication uh, I will provide you with that same link so that uh, you'll know uh, and, and be able to access uh, the, the budget, the CAP, the pay plan, as well as our plan is to, to um, in one consolidated place, put uh, prior council communications and all the attachments, as well as uh, copies of the presentations for you. Um, we will continue to, um, as we have done in the past, continue to consecutively number uh, our council communication and um, our, our attachments um, because there will be uh, opportunity um, from time to time for us to refer back to information that we have, may have provided to you in a prior council meeting. So um, when this meeting is over, we will send you the link of where you can find the proposed documents. And then uh, we will continue to add to that each week um, from that point on. So Mayor Council, I wanted to give you all an opportunity. We gave you the highlights. Are there any questions for us? I think I saw some hands. So, so my question before we go to that, do you have a CIP presentation then or will that be in September? We're, we're moving that to September. That's a fairly okay. lengthy presentation and we right. knew it'd go longer. Okay. Does anyone have questions over the, the budget summary at this point? All right, it was all pretty clear, I thought. So Harold, anything else? Uh, Dr. Waters? I don't know that it's so much about the budget summary, but as we schedule out, as we look at the schedule, um, and as we uh, have a chance to, uh, I guess, will we'll, we'll, we'll we see, will adv the advanced metering be in the CIP budget? Correct. Carol, I mentioned to you that uh, I may be the only council member who, as we listen um, to the input we had tonight about metering, uh, wireless versus wired metering, and um, all the statements that are made <laughs> about the risks cost benefits risks associated with wired versus wireless metering. Um, personally, if we're gonna budget seven and a half million dollars in 2021, um, I, would, I would benefit greatly if we could have a session not unlike what we did when we were talking about 5G, uh, when we looked at the legal aspects, whatever uh, science there is, um, and, I, and there are members of this council who have expertise that I don't have, Maybe I just need a tutorial, but I would sure appreciate the opportunity to hear from Tim Schlock, uh, uh, Schlock, is it Schlocky? 
and our own and, and David and our other our own experts on what we're doing so we could if I'm going to make a, an informed vote I'd like to make that feeling like I have the benefit of hearing all the perspectives on this issue. So David was actually prepared to touch on that tonight. He will touch on it on the CIP and I'm sure he heard your comments. All right, so uh, thank you, Dr. Waters. Harold, seeing all their comments or questions, um, we thank you and we look forward to the annual process of dealing with the budget, fun times. And Jim, thank you as always, we appreciate your work and Teresa, you too. All right, let's go on to mayor and council comments. Who would like to make a comment? Councilman Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Uh, I would like to tell council and anybody who's listening that on uh, Sept September 21st, the North Metro in line is opening up and it's gonna be free rides for, uh, for the residents. Um, the reason that this is important and why I want to bring it up is that the inline is part of the North RTD Fast Tracks North Metro Line, which is one of the stages going into our Northwest Corridor. Um, kudos to Mayor Bagley because he and I and all of the other transportation committees that we are on have been working very, very hard to get this inline finished. And now that it's finished and completed, uh, all of these different agencies are turning their attention to the nor our Northwest Corridor. So um, it, it is like we have not been doing anything, but there's been a lot of hard work behind the scenes. I'm very excited about this because it's taken a long time. And now we can all uh, in the city, in the district, on the corridor, focus our attention on getting this Northwest Corridor uh, completed. So if you would like a free ride, see what's coming up uh, September 21st. Thank you. Thanks, Joan. Anybody else? All right, cool. Harold, do you have any comments? I think I've talked enough tonight, Mayor. <laughs> That's no what I, I, I wasn't gonna say it. <laughs> Not me. All right, Eugene. You've been quiet tonight, Fairly. You can say something if you'd like. No comments, Mayor. That's why I love you. All right. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. I'll second. All right. There's a motion to adjourn on the table. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right. The, the ayes have it unanimously. Until next week, people. And Harold, I'll uh, stop by to sign everything tomorrow. All righty. Great. Thank you, guys. Good night.